Thank you. So welcome everybody to the House Bill 5006 workgroup meeting. Uh, this is Robin Harkless with Oregon Consensus providing facilitation services to the group. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items while people are still joining us um, in the Zoom room. Uh, for those of you who are workgroup members, um, really helpful and encouraged today uh, showing your face on video if you can, recognizing that there are limitations to that for some of us at times, so I recognize that. Um, and also change your name on your um, profile to name and who you are affiliated with for uh, this workgroup. Uh, that'll help us and the public kind of be tracking and seeing. And then for those of you who are members of the public or non-work group members, um, just ask that you stay off screen uh, unless you have a speaking role at some point, um, and we'll keep you on mute uh, so you can listen in, but really uh, center the work group uh, members today in the conversation. So that's how we'll roll that. Um, a couple other quick announcements. Um, Kristen, Anton, and Kathleen, uh, we know will not be able to join us today. Um, uh, send their regrets. And I know a few of them have been in contact with other members of the work group to kind of help carry some of their uh, interests and ideas forward in this conversation. Um, we also have a member ship member switch. So just wanted to welcome Lauren Poor into the group. Uh, Lauren, if you want to say a few words by way of introduction, we welcome that. Um, and the rest of you, just so you're aware, there was an email sent out. Marianne Cooper sent an email out to the whole group um, just a little while ago with uh, an announcement. So um, go ahead, Lauren, real quick. Thanks. Hi, everyone. So um, most of you I've worked with before. So I'm Lauren uh, Poor, formerly Smith, so that's how most of you know me. Um, so yeah, I recently got married, so sorry for that. Um, but uh, as you guys know, uh, Marianne, um, unfortunately, is leaving Oregon Farm Bureau. So um, I am jumping back into the water space after uh, just a little bit of time away. But um, I've worked with um, most of you, not all, you know, not all of you, but most of you um, during my uh, previous uh, positions with either AOC or um, OWRC when I used to work with April. So I'm um, happy to be back um, and uh, looking forward to uh, continuing these conversations on behalf of Oregon Farm Bureau. Moving forward. Welcome. Um, yes, we're sad to see Marion go. Also welcome you. Also congratulate you on you getting married. You don't have to apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> it gets very uh, confusing with the name. <laughs> yes. Um, but thank you to the uh, Farm Bureau for making sure there's continuity in this process. Um, and uh, any other housekeeping? I think just a reminder, it was, uh, we, we kind of, sometimes we, we slip into having conversations over chat and it, it gets really uh, distracting, hard to track. So would really just appreciate, again, reminding folks that the conversation should be held in this space together. And unless we invite you to put something in the chat by way of a response to a question, um, we'd really prefer that you use the raise hand function on the Zoom to get in the queue for the dialogue. Um, that we're really centering the work group members in this conversation. We have a, a short uh, window for a public comment. That being said, for members of the public, if you are interested in having some time at this public meeting today, please send a chat to Jenna Stillman, my colleague at Oregon Consensus, and um, we can track that along the way and let folks, let the work group member know if there are a number of folks that want to provide comments. So we can, we can let you decide if you want to make some adjustments to the time work group members, if there are a number of the public members of the public that would like to, to weigh in. Um, and all that being said, just uh, settle in. We'll take a break around 1230. We have a lot to get through today. This is all centered around continuing to evolve the recommendations that are kind of part of the straw proposal. And 
We have not gotten into any of the discussions around the process and pathways one. So that'll be really the center stage for today's discussion. We have a number of items still to get through with the community engagement section. Um, and then we'll parlay issues forward for your October 20th meeting that get us through the rest of the straw. Um, caveat all this with there were some agreements that were made at the last meeting, particularly around the data and technical analysis recommendations. Uh, we clarified some things with, within terms and definitions, but those still need to be buttoned up. So just know that some of those issues are going to come back around for you all to kind of really take a closer look at um, the refinements. And it won't be your last chance to weigh in uh, on your consensus level of agreements on some of these recommendations moving forward. But we need to keep moving forward. So that's how the deliberative agenda has been set up for today. Um, and I will remind us in a little while about what agreements you did actually make last time. But um, before I do that, just want to um, pop over to the department, Water Resources Department, for any other uh, housekeeping or updates before we get underway with the substantive agenda. So I'll invite Raquel and or Lily to, to join us. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Okay, I'm not double needed. That's the first step. Um, so good morning. Uh, good to see all of you. Uh, I just wanted to provide a brief update. I know some of you have been tracking the department's efforts um, to at least have a, an LC um, in as good as shape as, as possible for the upcoming session. And uh, we did have a meeting last Friday with um, some of you. Um, as well as other folks um, that attended and uh, talked about uh, the legislative concept language that we've continued to evolve over time since I think it was last February or March when we had introduced um, our initial version. So I want to be um, clear with folks that um, we're now uh, going on pause on that work um, because we're now waiting to see what comes from this group. And um, that will then, this, the recommendations from this group will then be used to further evaluate how we modify that LC um, going forward. Of course, um, you know, the department's priority has been to make sure that we have a vehicle for continuing um, planning into the future, uh, given that our authority to fund planning um, sunsets um, next year. So. Um, that's the reason we have that um, legislative concept that um, is uh, continuing to be developed. And so we really look forward to seeing what comes from this work group and evaluating um, what recommendations uh, may need to be uh, included in that uh, legislative concept effort. So I'll leave it there. I think that's that's an update I have on my end. Um, Lily, did you have anything else to add? I don't think in terms of housekeeping. Okay. All right, well, we look forward to seeing um, what the recommendations in a couple months here. And I'm on Robin, you're muted. Yeah, to tee us up for uh, the substantive deliberations today, Lily was going to provide just kind of a reminder and overview of kind of how this straw proposal has been evolving um, over time. And I will just remind us of kind of the pivot that was made from the work group in August uh, to really focus on uh, evolving the next generation of place-based planning. And so most of these recommendations are kind of geared and centered toward um, that particular focus. Um, and I recognize that um, that particular focus also nests within a broader system of planning and management in Oregon. And so there are conversations that you all are continuing to have that uh, relate also to that context. And so uh, we're going to open up some conversation about that today um, while we still stay tethered and tied to our focus of uh, evolving the next generation of place based planning. So with that, I'll let you take it away, Lily. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. 
Yeah, so this might be a little redundant for you all, but since there's a lot going on, um, a lot of documents to review, I just wanted to take a few minutes at the beginning to make sure that we're all sort of on the same page about the intent behind this draft framework and recommendations, um, <clears throat> go over where we are in the process and where we expect to go with it moving forward. Um, so first, I think it's helpful to say that the intent of these drafts is to describe a framework and path for place-based planning moving forward. It's intended to describe the outcomes that this group would like to see in the next generation of place-based planning. And we really wanna reflect what this group would like decision makers to consider as they create legislation, but the report itself is not meant to be legislative language. So um, with that, I'm gonna to show, you our, show you all where we are in the process. I'm gonna put up some slides because I'm a very visual person. So um, I thought it might be helpful. So just bear with me while I share my screen. Um, okay, can you all see that? Okay. Um, so just to recap, as we created the draft framework and recommendations, we attempted to take all of the work that this group has done over the, the six months that we started with and put it into a framing that would help guide discussion and create the basis for a final report. And this included work group discussions, the shared learning that we did, the brainstorming that we did. Um, we looked at some of the very foundational documents, um, the IWRS, the 100 year water vision, the place-based planning independent evaluation, the draft planning guidelines, and the place-based planning pilot authorization SB 266. And then in August, we did an options and scenarios exercise with all of you, which further refined ideas around how to frame recommendations. Um, and then as Robin said, it, they did a consensus check in August as well that sort of confirmed the narrowing of our focus onto the next generation of place-based planning. In August, also the community engagement task group drafted a guide for place-based planning. And so all of these things we took and uh, created it created the foundation for version one of the um, draft framing and recommendations that we sent out on August 24th. So in version one, we included, um, if you remember, some sourcing about where those, that framing and recommendations came from, like if it came from the evaluation or if it came from a work group meeting, we tried to, at a high level, source all of these things so you could really see the through line. Um, as we developed the, the draft. Um, so then uh, to get feedback on version one, we sent out a worksheet sheet that helped revise the draft by setting a deliberative agenda for the September work group meeting and offering friendly amendments to the draft. And based on those amendments and the discussion and consensus checks from the September 6th meeting, we drafted version two. Um, and you, you all got a lot of documents. We tried to be as transparent as possible as we um, took those changes and put it into version two. We sent out a summary of the revisions. We sent out a red line draft. And we also sent out detailed responses to questions and suggestions from those um, 14 worksheets that were submitted. Um, as we move toward the final report, we also cleaned this draft up a little and we removed those sources that were in version one. But if you have any questions, I would encourage you to look back at version one if you're looking for where some of these things came from. Um, so from version two, we've received seven worksheets back, um, which in addition to the items that we didn't get to in the September meeting have helped frame the deliberative agenda for today as Robin has already said. Um, and moving forward, we're hoping to use the discussions from today and from October 20th to uh, revise these, the framing and recommendations and incorporate anything new. As some of you noted um, in your worksheets, some of these recommendations are a little, can be a little redundant. So we're hoping to streamline where it's appropriate and um, put these recommendations and this framing into the outline of a final report, which Robin is gonna go into a little bit um, deeper later today. Um, we're also hoping to streamline the introduction and framing, uh, that initial framing into, based on the conversations that happened today as well. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say before we sort of dive in is that I really, we all really wanna make sure that this draft reflects 
the will of the work group. So if you feel like there's something missing from the draft, something that we missed from the independent evaluation or anything else, please do not hesitate to put it in a worksheet and bring it forward. We really wanna capture that um, as we move further down the road to the final report. Um, and I think with that, that's all I really wanted to, to talk about. And I will turn it back to you, Robin. Thanks, Lily. Any quick questions for the department, Kimberly? Yeah, I'm not sure this is a quick question, but I'll at least just raise it now. Um, I am so confused about where this lies in the spectrum of all the other documents. Um, I appreciate we're sort of addressing bits and pieces, but you know we've got the integrated water resources strategy, we've got the place-based planning draft guidelines, we've um, got the assessment, and there are some foundational pieces in there that are not in this document. And so my assumption was, you know, when we pivoted to place-based planning, in my mind, um, I imagined that we were gonna be focusing on areas where we either wanted to adjust things in place-based planning, existing, existing sort of framework and or add. Um, and I just wanna, I guess I feel like I need confirmation of that because I'm a little worried that, that we're not all on the same page about what in fact this document is. Um, so in other words, this framework for me would not take the place of all the existing documents. And I guess I'm just wondering what the, the department is envisioning. I didn't, I didn't, at least I didn't hear it clearly in the explanation. Lily or Raquel? I think that was a question for the department, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so um, Kimberly, I don't know that this is an adequate response, um, but I think that we're looking at this document. So the recommendations that come from this work group to inform potentially, depending on what the recommendations are and where they fit appropriately, um, inform further work as it pertains to in, in further the program for place-based planning. And that may be, depending on the recommendation, integrated either through legislation, rulemaking, or guidance. And um, so I, I see that as where these recommendations, you know, will fit is that we'll be um, using them to um, further that work for the program. And in regards to the previous um, documents, um, I think that, so the, there's the statute, I think I heard you say, well, it's not a statute yet, um, the Oregon laws currently for the program, um, which we're seeking to run legislation, which has some sideboards that I think you're um, talking about and pointing to. I think we're trying to integrate into the legislative concept um, some of the other documents that you are referencing, such as um, the Integrated Water Resources Strategy Guiding Principles. There's also um, the Place-Based Planning Guidelines, I think is um, something else you had referenced. And all of those items will need to evolve over time and be updated over time. So I don't want to say that um, those will, those aren't necessarily gonna go away, but they're not necessarily gonna stay the same. So I think what's important for this group, if there's something that you think is important for this group to um, either affirm or to uh, make a recommendation about changing um, any one of those things, I think this is the, you know, a good time to do it. Granted, as we go through those processes down the line, you know, if we're doing a rulemaking or if we're doing legislation, um, we may start with the recommendations of the work group. Um, but as you know, we're always, you know, working to get input. And 
um, there's a public comment process on rules. And so, um, so it, I can't say that everything's going to look exactly the same as um, what comes from the work group, but we're certainly seeking to use the recommendations to inform um, those you know, future work products. So I don't know if that is helpful. Um, and uh, I'm certainly happy to answer their questions, Lily or Robin, I don't know if you have anything to add because um, you all have been in this process a bit longer than I have, um, but that's kind of my perception um, of where we're going. Is that helpful, Kimberly? Yeah, that's actually super helpful. So just shorthand way of saying this is not the sum total of how the state will move forward on place-based planning. It's one of many pieces is what I heard. And then I guess one quick follow-up question is we still have the place-based planning assessment um, you know, that was uh, done with participants of the pilots. Um, we're touching on some of those tension points, but not all. Um, I guess the question is, should we raise those now or is there a path forward there? I know one of the recommendations was there was a path forward. So I just I just want to make sure we don't lose that piece because I think um, a lot of people put a lot of time into that. I know that the um, program um, has been, you know, looking at the assessment and part of the recommendations in the assessment we've been um, we've brought forward to this group to consider and to um, provide recommendations uh, um, based on that assessment. I think we'll continue to look at the assessment as we continue to develop the program. Um, I can't say today that everything that is in the assessment is necessarily going to move forward. Um, you know, there will likely be portions that move forward and there will likely be portions that either we don't have the capacity or bandwidth to address or um, or maybe that, you know, this group doesn't agree with, for example, and um, or maybe the as we go through the public process that there's not agreement on. So I can't say that every single thing in the assessment will necessarily be implemented, um, but we're certainly looking at that, that assessment. Um, and its recommendations um, and trying to have that inform our efforts. I might just add, Kimberly, for the purposes of the work group and the final kind of product that comes out of this group, um, I'm gonna kind of show an outline of, of the sections that we will likely populate for that final report. And one is around issues surfaced but not fully addressed. And I wonder if that might actually be a place um, if the group does not cover the whole suite of um, evaluative findings from that pilot, um, if there are particular issues that you or others on the work group feel are important that the state or future decision makers should be aware of and bring into their kind of informing whatever next steps happen, that might be another place to flag those really clearly. And so I think Lily's invitation stands. If you're not seeing something that came out of the evaluation that you feel is really important and it's not on the table for this group, welcome to bring it forward. And the backstop would be, hey, we never actually addressed this piece, but it's important to like make a statement about that from the work group. That might be kind of two different ways to approach it. Um, Kaylin, and then I'm going to ask that we move along. Thanks, Robin. Um, I I think given our, our major pivot um, at the end of August uh, and the fact that this work group um, has been seated uh, out of a legislative appropriation, um, I just think we're going to be need, we're going to need to be very clear about the elements of the place-based planning evaluation that we considered and adopted, or considered and didn't come to um, agreement on, or considered and outright rejected, or didn't consider at all. Um, because as um, Raquel and others uh, highlighted, there has been a lot of effort um, that went into that evaluation, and it it was conducted by a third party um, based on countless interviews. So I think there's a lot of good content in there. And if we, if our recommendations deviate 
from the recommendations that are reflected in that evaluation, my concern is that those deviations are going to be interpreted to mean something and are going to be interpreted to, um, unless we are very careful in saying why they're different. Um, and I, I, I think this is just a result of um, where we found ourselves in the process with a significant narrowing after a, a period of months of kind of blue sky conversations around what state supported regional planning and management could look like. Um, those are just some reflections. Yeah, thank you. I think that's really good food for thought too of how we um, how we tailor the work group product, the final report of which recommendations are tied to which findings, which findings were not addressed by this work group, which recommendations might be outside the, the realm of those particular findings. Um, so appreciate that. Um, I think with that, and you know, we can keep massaging this uh, and making sure that for those who really care about making clear linkages and, and making sure that this is uh, accurately reflects the, what the group kind of is pulling, pushing forward, that isn't the whole suite of issues that um, future decision makers should be considering around place-based planning or other types of planning or management investments. Um, but let's let's put a pin in that for now. We'll come back to that a little bit at the end of today's conversation. Um, for the, I'm just gonna share my screen for a moment to um, show you where we're at. Um, for those of members of the public, we sent out a deliberative agenda to the work group. So um, this is what it is. <laughs> We've got a section on framing the recommendations the community engagement guide and recommendations, and then the process and pathways recommendations out of the straw. That's as far as we'll likely get today. Any spillover will happen at the October 20th meeting, which is our next scheduled meeting. And then we'll resume with more deliberative topics um, that I'll talk about uh, later. But for now, let's, uh, let's look at this particular issue. Um, so I think Lily did a, I think you did reflect what the directive and assumptions that went into drafting the straw proposal iterations. Um, I do wonder, Lily, if you want to say anything more about any kind of out of legislation or other uh, informing guidance that came to this work group, if there are any other uh, notes that you want to make for the group about the things that are sort of the assumptions that went into this. Um, and then I'd like the work group members to reflect on um, two pieces of the puzzle. First about what is the value proposition of the place-based planning tool? You know, we really have in bits and pieces been able to, to kind of articulate that, but I think there are some of you who feel like you need to say it explicitly. Why are we doing this and what's the value of this particular tool? There are others who feel it's important to say what's the appropriate role in place for place-based planning within the context of the broader water planning and management system. So I want to just give a little air time for that and invite you in to have some discussion with each other. It's not a consensus point, but it could very well inform what might be the introductory statement of the work group um, for your final report. So that's where it might lead to. Um, so let me just pause for Lily for a moment. Um, and then I've got a few people waiting in the wings actually who wanted to say a few words about this. Was there anything else, Lily, that you hadn't mentioned about the direction or the assumptions that went into the straw? Um, I think I would just uh, reiterate sort of that the, the non-negotiables sort of from HB 506 was that we build on the IWRS and the 100-year water vision. And so we tried to capture that um, in the draft as well. Um, and then also, we've talked about this already um, at length, but the pivot sort of towards the next generation of of place-based planning. And that um, was sort of the, the framing that we used going into the, the straw draft. Okay. So um, I've been doing a round of some calls with folks um, and you know, I know that they're, you know, in addition to putting direct comments onto the straw proposal, you're also kind of thinking about, you know, what 
why are we doing this? What's behind this? What's the value proposition? And I just want to invite um, Kate and Adam forward uh, from the perspective of two very different regional planning efforts. One was a place-based planning effort. One's been an ongoing on the ground. Um, you've been having some conversations. I just invite you to share some of your thoughts um, at this moment. I guess, Robin, since you said my name first, I'll go first. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. I have a COVID caveat. I, when I spoke with Robin last week and Adam, I was fuzzy and I thought I would be all recovered, but I'm still super fuzzy. So please have some grace with any inarticulateness today. Um, so yeah, I mean, at, at the most basic level, the way I think about regional planning efforts, you know, the state framing around meeting state goals of in-stream and out-of-stream balance are, are key to everything in the state around water. Um, but within that, each basin is a unique hydrogeologic situation and has a different context for supply and demand dynamics. And I think most importantly at the bottom line for me that the water solutions are going to be implemented at the basin level. That's how water works. Um, and so it depends actually on relationships at the basin level to implement the water projects that need to happen and to do that work. So for me, from where I sit in the Deschutes at least, it makes all the sense in the world to do basin level planning and project implementation uh, and for the state to support this work. I will say, you know, in the Deschutes, we have had pretty significant success doing this work together over the last 25 years. We've really restored stream flows. We've made agricultural reliability better. We've generated water for the cities. Um, you know, all through building relationships and moving forward where we can. So I just want to sort of underline that, again, that projects will always be implemented at the basin level. And so having some level of basin planning involvement seems critical to me. I do want to acknowledge, I think the state does play a critical role in this. This might go to the, the second part of your question, Robin. Um, bringing data is a huge one. Everything that we've done in the Deschutes has been built on a common foundation of a basin water budget. We have a collective understanding in the basin on all sides of the water supplies and demands. So without that, I don't, it's, it would be much harder. Um, I do think the state could play a strong role in prioritizing where the highest priority basins are from a state goals perspective. And hopefully there's some overlap with where there's a community desire to plan based on perceived urgency in that community. Um, and I think you know the state can support communities within that framework and planning as well as implementation. Um, so you know, place-based planning in my mind is not a replacement for other state processes by any means, but situating uh, regional basin planning where the state and local interests are all involved is in my mind the foundation of what sound water management and planning would look like. Um, particularly, again, because the way you're going to solve problems is implementing projects on the ground. And so that, that you know, those projects are dependent on um, partners in a base and working together and understanding the unique particular context. So thanks for that opportunity to, to share my thoughts on it. Thank you. Adam, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, Robin, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I, I think as we, uh, we've been talking uh, about the value with respect to place-based planning, um, uh, I, I kind of felt compelled uh, to, to pull out from, from my, uh, my experience with uh, respect to place-based planning on a, on a couple different items, most notably, um, uh, serving as a co-convener for the Mid-Coast Water Planning Partnership. Uh, and there seems to be this, this question with respect to the value of place-based planning. And I think we all recognize that, that perhaps place-based planning is not for every community. Maybe, it, uh, maybe it's not for every basin even. Uh, but as a tool, as, as an effective tool for fostering the necessary collaboration to build consensus around shared water interests, whether those are in-stream 
for out of stream interest. There is, in, in my opinion, after four decades in water and wastewater, there, there doesn't seem to be a better tool that um, potentially has the greatest value for solving um, basin issues uh, anywhere in the state. Um, and, and let's face it, we're, um, we're seeing uh, a lot of crisis uh, around the country regarding water and, and water related issues. And we're beginning to see those or experience similar crisis here in, in Oregon and, and even in the mid coast uh, with um, water scarcity issues, uh, depending on the time of year. And so I think the, the real opportunity for us here, and, and I know we all get this, is that we show up to the table here to have this conversation about water. And we have this opportunity to maybe help the state uh, in guiding how water is managed, uh, you know, potentially managed through place-based planning and basins throughout Oregon. So there's a tremendous value, not, not just inherent in what we're doing, but in the future of how water is managed for the state of Oregon. And I think we're, we're right at this pivotal point that we're um, challenged with this you know, awesome opportunity to help the state uh, guide the future of how water is managed through the conversations that we're having right now. And, and I, I can appreciate the fact that, um, that some of us uh, may have different interests and, and concerns with respect to water and water management and, and whose authority uh, uh, water management will, will uh, you know, how that will be guided uh, under what authority. Um, but you know, probably considered place-based planning, you know, has the authority to unite communities around the topic of managing water. And, and for those communities like ours, you know, we, we have completed uh, a water plan that's been uh, adopted by the state. And for those folks that participated in that plan, their, their projects uh, uh, are addressed there, the challenges are addressed in that plan. And, and the value uh, for our community is that we now have uh, you know, uh, a better opportunity for funding when it comes available because our plan is, is, you know, addresses the issues, the significant issues that we struggle with uh, here in the Mid Coast region so that when funding does become available um, for our communities. And, and I recognize that, that we're talking about something in the future beyond um, uh, what we're doing here. But I think there's tremendous value in recognizing that those communities that are struggling with water issues, uh, there's a potential that through place-based planning, they'll be able to address those e issues and seek funding and, and recognize that they would have uh, a competitive edge because their issues are addressed in a region-wide or, or basin planning effort. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's kind of understood to inherent in, in place-based planning that it is a voluntary association. Um, and I said this, it, it may not be appropriate for all communities. Uh, but it, it actively seeks to include diverse perspectives, interests, expertise regarding water issues within the, within the region. It seeks to include, but is not limited to repre representation um, that is broadly based. So uh, not just municipalities, uh, but also special districts uh, to include tribes uh, and industrial users for, for us that is the fishing industry, when you put that many groups around the table to discuss water issues, 
there is a value all of its own uh, in, in dealing with that group and learning from each other and how uh, you struggle uh, in meeting the needs of your interests. So I just wanted to encourage us that everything that we're doing, doing today centered around value sends an important message to message to our uh, state legislators just how important this topic is for communities that we all serve. So hopefully that helps out a little bit, uh, Rob, and I hope that's what you were looking for. Kimberly. Um, first of all, I just wanted to uh, really thank Kate and Adam for your perspective. I think you said a lot of, um, you know, very, your insight is very valuable um, and we agree with much of what you were saying. That said, I think I'm gonna, um, as far as, I think the question is, is, or I think this is what you're asking, Robin, it should there be a value statement in the document? And I think Water Watch has- I'm, not, I'm actually not asking that. Oh, you're not, okay, then I'm I won't asking, get- okay. I'm actually asking for just a, inviting some airtime for all of you to talk about this um, these two parts, which is there's a value proposition around building out this tool, but the tool is a tool that sits within a broader context of, of planning and management. And that other piece of the puzzle around, you know, why should we support a tool like this and what's the value of the tool? But then where does it sit within the system? And I think it's both of those things that I'm inviting you to, to talk about. And I know that Kimberly, you have some thoughts on both, both of those questions. Yeah, and it, it does, um, you know, I guess I will just recognize that I think everyone in this group is coming from different directions. Just as background, WaterWatch did participate in two of the place-based planning, um, which we are still participating in the Harney, but also the John Day. And then we've been working with Kate and others in the Deschutes. So we, we have some background here. Um, I, um, I guess I do these, do these planning endeavors have value? Yes. Um, but, and again, this gets back to like what's in the report, what's not, because I think you know, in the assessment, it was very clear that there was a broad spectrum of viewpoints about the value of place-based planning. Um, and that ranged from optimistic to qualified support to downright skeptical. Um, and so WaterWatch is here working in good faith to try and make the place-based planning process better. But we are a little uncomfortable with um, if there is a document that tries to place a value statement on what we are doing, because I, I don't think we were asked that at the outset, it's not in the operating protocols. Um, it wasn't, you know, I think different groups probably had different input in the, in the uh, organ consensus assessment. So start, sorry, I keep going back to the document, but it is really important for those of us who play in Salem, having a report that reflects sort of a group position um, uh, gets a little sticky. So, and I'm not at all trying to undermine, you know, I think what Kate and Adam said again is very valuable. I think we just, have different people have different perspectives. So I would caution us about trying to put the value piece in writing. Jeff, thank you, Kimberly. Appreciate that. Uh not surprising. I might. I. I don't think this is a contrary point of view, but it, it might sound like it, Kimberly. So I don't mean it to be that way. Um, I think we were spinning. If we were just going to do this process and not have it be seen in a glo more global context, we could have done this meeting in two hours and just extend the sunset and be done with it. So I think there's more to it. Um, to me, it's more about the quality of the of the process, the con uh, continuum between planning, feasibility, and then projects. If we're not getting to the end where good projects can be done, then I call the question about what's the point. And 
we need to have all the proper existing um, triggers about how the that water is allocated and all those types. I'm not even getting into that part of the equation. To me, my my base, and I'm just curious if others feel this way, is about is it command and control or is it kind of coming bubbling up from a particular area that's trying to solve a particular problem? So to me, I think those fundamental there, there, there's a fundamental element that you would want to have local folks as engaged as they possibly can with the tools that they can possibly manage either self-funded themselves through a collaboration or with some state assistance. Um, the state, I think the state has a role to try to, as much as possible, obtain consistency. So it may, it's just not the loudest voice in the room getting the funding uh, or the loudest voice to prevent funding. So I just, I just think that Overall, there's so many, there's so many places where a lot of the people on this phone call are going to fight, are going to fight, but it's okay. But let's try to get a place-based plan. If we see the value in place-based planning, then let's try to give some cues, some, some ability for people to actually work through the process. I, I'm still... I still have no idea if we can go from a place-based planning to a feasibility to a project and if it works. Mm -hmm. I want to try to see if it can. So that's just my global view. And it's far more reactive to Kimberly, who I've spent more hours in a in a room with than most of you. Um, but I, I just, I mean, I don't I don't mean it as a contrary thing. I think it's just about globally, what do we expect this process to be? So thank you. And can it be a both and? I mean, I think that's really inviting the conversation of, can you hold both of these things? Um, can they not necessarily need to be mutually exclusive? And as we continue to work through um, improving the place-based planning tool, um, those tensions won't go away, but maybe you get it to the size, to the right kind of, um, so that it's the best tool, the most optimal tool that it can be nested within uh, a bigger context of planning and management. I think that's holding space for both of those is really what I'm intending to help you all articulate for yourselves. Kaylin? Thanks, Robin. And um, I think I agree with more um, than of what everyone has said than I disagree. Um, I. I want to again kind of just recognize the context and how it shifted from initially where um, we uh, we all uh, jumped into the fray for this work group with the understanding that we are we're looking broadly at how do we make some recommendations for improving how we do regional water planning um, with state support and now we are moving to a, you know, the question that was posed to the group is, do you agree that continuing a program like place-based planning is desired? And I think the thing that I'm struggling, that I continue to struggle with is, um, yes, it's, I would answer that, you know, it's something like it. I, I mean, it's, there's, there's so much ambiguity tied up in the question that it's difficult to answer. Um, you know, I, I participated also in, in several of the, the place-based planning pilots. And, um, you know, to Jeff's point, yeah, we have not gotten to a point where any projects that have been identified in a place-based planning process have subsequently had time to then apply for feasibility study grants or have subsequently had time from that process to secure um, state funding for those. So, I, I just, I think that there's elements that we all have agreed on from the beginning, which, you know, Kate brought them up, like fundamentally in the Deschutes, having data that an analysis that people, fund, you know, foundationally agree to, of this is what our supply and demand is now, um, this is what we're looking at in the future, how do we bridge that gap if there is a gap, 
um, I, I feel like all of us and the planning assessment and um, the groups themselves have said, we desperately need that data. That makes water planning better, however you slice it, whether it's place-based planning, whether it's integrated water resource strategy updates, whether it's something we haven't even discussed or thought of. Um, and so I, I just, I do, I, I'm, I'm chafing, I think, at the narrowing because it's, um, I think we agree that, that some kind of place-based planning is a tool that has value, but the way that it's currently phrased, um, it may come across that it is, we're all agreeing that it's the best tool um, for every place. And I, that's not where I'm at. Um, I think that there are other approaches that um, other states have done. You guys keep hearing me bring up what other states have done. I'm going to say it till my last meeting um, here. So apologies uh, in advance. But um, I, I just think that we, uh, we need to be very clear that this is one approach that we've evaluated. Um, and it is not at all the only approach that um, can be pursued in the future. Thank you, Kaylin. I think one more comment, Dan, and we'll move on. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, make sure am I muted? No, not muted. Great. Okay. How about that. <laughs> Let's start. Um, yeah, I mean, I really agree with all the early comments. I mean, I think it, to me, it seems pretty intuitive that there's there's value in the process. Um, you know, I, I, I think you can even look at examples in Oregon, where it's maybe not in this in any particular formal way, but you had groups working together in the, in the Deschutes for a long time who have definitely implemented a lot of projects. I helped, I voted to fund some of those projects through OWEB because of the uh, cooperation and the, you know, this that really effectively was place-based planning in, in the Deschutes. Um, the Malheur, I think to a certain degree in terms of where you got really divergent folks together out there, it led to um, some pretty significant, and don't forget, it can be federal funding. It doesn't have to be state funding. It has led to projects that came through through other sources. But I, I think that the last couple of points to raise, one thing is just that there has to be that inherent flexibility in whatever, the program is because you're going to have just a huge range of capacities around the state. You're going to have different needs. Um, it has to be flexible enough to accommodate that. And then in terms of getting stuff done and moving forward, and we haven't, nobody's really mentioned this too much, is the key part of the state's role, I think, or whoever it is, is getting money to make it happen, whether it's funding basic capacity for a basin to be able to have a group that can get together on one hand or, or getting more into the hard data of um, the hydrological data and everything that you need to get in there, which requires money. And then one of the findings on the place-based finding, I mean, that was one of the things is people ran into data deficiencies and found out, oh gosh, that costs a lot of money and that takes a lot of time to do it. And that's the reality of it. But I think having the something that encourages the groups to get together to start talking and actually recognizing and realizing they have problems then leads to the realization, hey, we need to know more stuff. And then there needs to be some kind of pipeline as part of this that where the state or somebody acknowledges, yes, once you've done that, we're willing to help to give the, give you money to overcome those obstacles. Again, whether it's organizational capacity or its data capacity. So that's that's it. I... Thank you. All right. So I think just holding space for for everything that folks have just said um, and and to recognize that, you know, yes, you see this is a valuable tool. There's reasons that it's unique, um, mostly around building the collaborative and the capacity of local communities to be empowered to inform the planning and that it's not the only tool and that it sits within a, a broader context. And there are other suites of tools that um, should also be 
in the toolbox for the state to do appropriate planning and management. Um, and there's a lot of nuance within that. So I just want to have you all just encourage you to hold space for all of those things as we move forward. The good news is you, you all, all had touched on data and you did reach some pretty um, clear consensus recommendations already around data. We'll circle back to those at the end of the meeting, not to take up time to, to go over those again. Um, but there's pieces at play that seem to also strike a little bit of a balance in some of these recommendations. So with that, um, let's move on to our next deliberative agenda section, which is the community engagement. Um, one, we need to see if we can get approval on this guide. There was only one person provided actual edits or comments to the guide. So we'll go over those and see if there's some way to make those changes and get this thing approved. Um, and then we'll move into the community engagement recommendations. We had one particular recommendation that there were some comments on from the worksheet responses that we'll touch on. Um, and the hope is that we really wrap this piece up today. We've spent a lot of time on the community engagement piece. So I'm hoping that this is our stop to kind of um, to wrap it up. That being said, we will I'll check at the end to see if there's still remaining and uh, what y'all want to do about that. Um, so this is going to take us up to our lunch break. Uh, so I'll be I'll be uh, asking us to, to end this at uh, 1235. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to invite Anna Molina, who's one of the engagement task group members, to just provide a little bit of reminder context of what you all, the task group, have been talking about as you've developed this community engagement guide about its purpose and what, what you intend it to be used for. So um, go ahead, Anna. Hi, everybody. Yeah, so the task group has been like meeting and working and trying to fine tune this community engagement guide. Um, and so basically, I think kind of um, it touches upon, uh, I think what OWR was saying of like, whatever comes out of the work group can be used, but it's like, we're not saying this can be used for legislative purposes. It's like, we're just saying like, this is a guide and OWR can use and implement as needed, but really just emphasizing that like, we want this to be a community engagement tool because it seems, yeah, like a community engagement tool um, to really look at like who's in those planning tables and assuring that like you have a diversity of voices and that folks are present. And if they're not present, then going back and making sure and ensuring that they do come to the table when it comes to um, whatever kind of water planning is happening. Um, and so again, their best practices for, for, for this, for community engagement um, and OWR can use as needed and maybe it can even be used as a public document for groups that are wanting to come together to do uh, water planning and have this guide of like, okay, how do we move forward in the steps of like, maybe it's something they haven't been involved in before, uh, but what can like, maybe this is a guide that they can use to like look through of like, okay, we, like we didn't do this, or maybe we should come back and, and make sure that we are talking to tribes and uh, when it really comes to setting like the table for these water planning conversations that it can be used to, to help that. Um, and so, yeah, so we've been working through it um, and appreciate everybody's feedback. I don't know if anybody else in the task group has anything else to add that I might've missed. Peggy. Thanks, Hannah. I really appreciate what you had to say. I just want to um, bring people back to understanding that right. in our subgroup work, we did lots of fine tuning, we did lots of uh, uh, many statements and everything. And we, after doing all that and putting everything down on paper, we all sort of came back to, there are some basic principles that we expect that community engagement to happen. And then here are some ideas about how you can um, address those principles. But instead of becoming so prescriptive about each of the items, instead what we said was meet these basic principles and here are some ways that you can do that. So I wanna make sure that people understand that we came from uh, becoming really um, 
really into the minutia back to what is it that we're really trying to accomplish. So thank you. Thank you. Um, there was one clarifying question for the task group on the guide. Um, I apologize, I didn't get it into the annotated that I sent you yesterday, but I'll just flag it. Um, there was a question about, um, <clears throat> pardon me, I need to find it now. Oh, the meaning of, there was a best practice under, um, I can't remember which guiding principle, but it said engage the public when possible in regional data gathering and analysis review to make information more digestible and trusted. Um, so there was just a clarifying question about what maybe the task group was thinking there and tending with that. And, uh, and just to, to caveat all of this with what we're hearing from the task group is this is intended to be a helpful guide. It's not intended to be a directive or a, um, this will go into, you know, statute or whatever, but um, that it should be used as a tool. I think, Anna, you called it a, a, an engagement tool. So with that, task group members, do you recall that the conversation you had around that particular best practice? Nikki has her hand up. Yeah, Nikki wasn't a task group member, so I want to just no. quickly get to the task group and then uh, I, I oh. see Nikki. <laughs> Robin, Robin, can you, can you uh, highlight where that is again? I'm sorry. Yeah, let's find it. Hold on one second. Well, while the task group's thinking. Yes, um, please do. <laughs> um, I often am in charge of, um, you know, staff and our team that develops like strategic communications and community engagement. And I felt that this was really a good guide based on best practices. And um, if you've done this kind of work, I think that statement really is about um, a lot of the water work we do is very complex and complicated and extensive. And it's really important when you're communicating uh, to the public or com in community engagement efforts that you can distill the information down into a framework that people can understand. And generally that can be like visually um, with graphics or pie charts, or it can be um, with videos kind of explaining things, but it's, it's a pretty, um, it's general practice amongst uh, public engagement folks. So I don't know if that helps Anna and Peggy, but um, that that's just something that's, you know, kind of a best practice that you're not throwing a bunch of complicated data to the general public and expecting them to disseminate it into what it means. <laughs> so I don't know while you guys are thinking, because you did, I just thought um, it was good. And I just, uh, have one statement. I just thought I'd jump in because that's how I read it. I don't know if that, I got a sob thumbs up from Peggy, so. Great. Um, yeah. Great. Oriana? Yeah, I think that accessibility piece is really important. And this may have come from um, some discussion we had around kind of engaging from a uh, uh, from like a, a metrics evaluation perspective as well. I think in our last meeting or a meeting ago, I shared the story of the beaver and the stream gauge where you can have kind of global data or data that comes from like a stream gauge that the state put in. But unless you talk to the people who are walking up and down the creek by that stream gauge the whole, uh, the whole time it's there, you don't necessarily know that the beaver built the dam and that's why it shows some drought uh, conditions. And so that in our experience doing work with community that that like interaction with data can be really valuable. One, because sometimes community has a different experience and tells a different story about the data than you might assume like the beaver and the stream gauge story. But also there are a lot of communities who feel like data gets acted upon them, um, that they're the subject of research or they're the subject of data and they feel disconnected from it and decisions get made and they have no voice and they feel like data can be something that 
is like an adversarial tool when it's, you know, in theory, objective. So giving community the opportunity to weigh in as well or share their local knowledge or wisdom can both make that data richer, but then also help ensure that people have that opportunity to respond to data and, and make sure that it is in the right context. And that if there are concerns about how the data is being presented or shared, that there's an opportunity to, to weigh in along the way. Thank you. So we found the best practice where it was located, Adam and others, is under a broader best uh, guiding principle of regional planning should sustain an informed public. And I think what we're hearing from Oriana, what was the intention was both to enrich in the data set so you engage folks, but also it seems like it's a trust building uh, and, and way to help groups get informed. Um, so that I'm hearing that's what the intention was from the task group. Yeah. Um, they also took a lot of these, the list of these things from the conversations that the larger work group had had in previous sessions about good community engagement, best practices and guiding principles. And they then basically organized it and discussed it and came up with what they thought is sort of the best suite of um, those headers, um, that the best practices are actually examples of how you might perform those best, those guiding principles, but that the guiding principles are really the, the kind of cornerstones, cornerstones of the good, of good engagement. Um, so Kimberly, Adam, and then Nikki, I know you had some more to offer to the group. Thanks. Um, yeah, first of all, I wanted to say, I really appreciated the work of um, this subgroup and I 100% agree with the intent of the document um, and the intent is articulated today. We had offered some comments and it was mostly, um, it was centered mostly around two things. One, and this ties to the first comment I made today, like how does this nest into sort of the larger building of a collaborative? Um, because the way it's sort of laid forth in the straw man, um, it's not, it's not clear that it's nested in that that community engagement is sort of one piece of building a collaborative so there's many pieces to building a collaborative this is one very important piece so I just I guess I would recommend that we are very clear about that and then the other sort of I think more substantive point I had made that um, in some just in a couple spots actually um, there are some policy what we interpret actually as sort of policy decisions being made in this document um, that fit better within the larger framework. And so, and I'm happy to send my comments out to anyone, um, but I had suggested that we pull those pieces out and deal with those in the larger framework. But, you know, again, the majority of the document um, we were in agreement with, it was just, um, those points, pulling out the policy piece and then clarifying how this fits in with the larger building of a collaborative, how that works, how that does, and that ties in to earlier conversations. Okay. Um, and Kimberly, there's we do have a couple of pieces on this deliberative agenda. If those are not the policy concerns and you'll have to be explicit, I think with the group about what you're asking them to pull and have put into the straw. Um, that would be helpful. Adam and Nikki. Uh, thank you, uh, Robin. Yeah, I just want to, I think it's already been said, but uh, uh, one of the things we we considered, um, and, and I think Peggy said it well, uh, in developing this as a, as a tool is recognizing that in many of our communities, uh, we have uh, individuals that uh, you know, English is a second language for them. And so uh, making sure that we were using tools that uh, considered how we uh, invite that group into the conversation, one, but also um, that, uh, you know, we, we uh, maybe on this call, uh, groups that represent the interests that we represent, the language that we use is 
is radically different than the, the language that the community uses with respect to, to water and the need for water and or even the value of water. Uh, and so making sure that uh, the language we use is language that's going to be understood and, and not from a, uh, so much from a technical background or from, from an engineering background. Um, so, and I think this does that besides the fact that it also, uh, it serves as a, a, an operation and maintenance manual almost, in, in my opinion, and, and, and it lays the groundwork for how to begin this process of place-based planning. And, and I, I think it, I, I, I agree that it could use some refinement, uh, but uh, it's a good place to start. Thank you. Nikki. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a, the work group did a really good job on this guide and I think attaching it um, to the, the propo straw proposal or whatever we end up with here is a good idea. I would wanted to just caution the group that, you know, this guide is it, its extent, it could be really an extensive effort and scope um, not to say it shouldn't be done, but I think to Adam's point, some of the applicants may not have the capacity or expertise to um, lead that effectively. Um, not every applicant is going to have extensive, like a lot of staff, you know, public outreach or engagement staff um, to lead through that. And so, you know, one of my comments is just, you know, if the state wants to include that level of um, engagement, you know, it didn't say you had to do everything, but um, it might be better if the state funded it and left led the effort. Um, I think that, you know, is something that that could be done unless it's assigned and you have an applicant that kind of has that capacity. So um, it's just, it's potentially like, if you have an engineer person coming forward and they're more of a technical expert is jumping into a a, a, just a totally different skill set um, than they may be used to. And so I just wanted to uh, put that out there. And, you know, I think there's even different kinds of translation services that are really important. Like we really lean heavy on having a, a person there um, in person, if translation is in not just like a phone service, like there's just a lot of just nuances that help community members feel more comfortable in a space that, um, that professionals really have that sense. And so um, I think a lot of the group members uh, also like understand that because they they play in that community engagement space a lot. But I just I just wanted to warn folks that not every applicant will be as familiar with that. And it could be something that's important for the state to fund and lead through the process. Great. I, I'm gonna just flag for Nikki uh, and others that the first recommendation in the straw under community engagement, it doesn't go into those that level of detail, but what it says is place-based planning funding should include support for meaningful community engagement at the outset and ongoing, would include resources for broad outreach, education, multiple channels for engagement and capacity building throughout the process. So I wonder if that encapsulates some of the, the concerns that you're having, Nikki, about different communities are gonna have different needs for support in addition to just funding for- it Kind of does, but it doesn't explicitly say like the state's role in that effort. Um, it kind of implies that they're funding those things to happen, um, maybe rather than leading the effort. Mm. Cause like, let's say you hire like the prep guy, someone's gonna have probably hire a consultant or have someone on board that's a professional in these areas. But when you're a project manager, knowing how to lead a consultant like that without experience can be challenging. And yeah. so um, I'm not saying it has to work that way in every case. Um, I think that might be broad enough. It's just a kind of a warning to the group that um, I don't know if every basin has that much, has that many staffing resources, especially rural basins to kind of lead everything we're putting in here yeah, and so that's where mm -hmm. yeah you might want to just you know maybe include a caveat in that statement that the staff may you know state may need to staff and lead um those efforts in specific basins I think would make me more comfortable so okay. thank you Peggy 
Thanks, Nikki. That was uh, uh, really helpful. It is one of the reasons that we moved from all of the little lists of things that were underneath the principles to going back to just the principles with examples. And it sounds to me like uh, maybe you can help us add to the examples, <laughs> which would be- I, I do think, usually hire professionals to do that, but um, you just I only know enough to know you guys pulled some really good best management practices. So yeah, you guys did a great job. <laughs> But anyway, so you know, any of those would be really good. I really wanted to bring us back to something that I think uh, simply needs to be um, ripped off right now. And that's, I think, one of the things that um, we heard from, from Kimberly in particular, that she has concerns about, and it's the community-led or uh, what other um, comments or what other definition to try to uh, come up with. And I think this is just a, a conversation that needs to be had by everybody in this room. What does community led mean? What does it mean related to the state having a, um, a clear uh, guiding role in following the state laws and rules while still being a community led um, process? And um, I just think it's time to have that conversation. What do you think, Peggy? Well, I'm a big proponent of the community led conversation while still making sure that we are following the state rules and laws. But I just really believe that the only way you get things done and you can use uh, the four blaze based planning groups, you can use Deschutes and other groups to show that it really takes the community itself getting together and then with the, the oversight and guidance of the state in order to actually accomplish things. And, uh, it, you know, it just takes those real people to do that. And so, so I am concerned if that's one of the policy areas that Kimberly is concerned about we just need to rip the bandage off and have that conversation about what it really means. Great. So Adam and Kimberly. Yeah, I, I, I probably should should have waited for Kimberly, but um, uh, Peggy, you you both asked the question uh, fairly and answered it correctly. Um, community led. In a, in a community led collaborative strengthens the community and the consensus necessary to make the decisions that are going to serve the community best. Uh, I, I agree 100%. Um, I think that the state needs to be a partner in that and maybe the state needs to help uh, fund that fundamental understanding and exercise and, and leadership perhaps for that community. Uh, the state also serves as a partner in, in, that, in that process as well. But my, uh, my experience in uh, several community-led processes is that they are stronger when the community leads, when the community has an investment in that topic of interest, uh, it, they are the, the most successful. Um, at least that's been my experience. And, and I'll, I'll give the floor. Can you, can you say more about, because I think that the word we're getting tripped up on is lead. <laughs> in the context of, you know, legally or authority or lead. So where Adam and Peggy, just help Kimberly understand what you mean when you say community led and Oriana and others, I know this is an important piece for you. So I guess weigh in on, on what you mean when you say community led. Um, you said partnership, Adam, I did hear that, but what are some other ways in which leadership well, show up? So I think that um, and, and I, I'll just talk about experience the, uh, and we had a difficult, we had a difficulty, um, a difficult time engaging, uh, 
several of our members here on the coast when we um, first reached out to our partners and once we informed them of this process of place-based planning and that, oh, by the way, the state is going to be a partner in this process, many of them said, okay, wait a minute. The state's going to participate in this. I might have some issues with that. My, I might have some risk to our autonomy. Maybe I'll lose my uh, water rights, for example. I know that was a big concern for a few of uh, our members in our partnership, which is, which is really the, the opposite. The state was not, uh, the state was showing up at the table as a partner. Uh, the state has a lot of tools that many communities can, can take advantage of in, in developing the kind of data, the, the kind of information. Because, and, and someone already said this, that you know, many of these communities don't have the capacity to do the kind of things that are necessary to foster successful planning, especially the kind of planning that we're talking about with respect to water in its uses in, in the future. But the state does, the state has that capacity. So the state shows up as a partner, uh, and at least that's, that's how, uh, that was the experience we had. Yes, they, they had the overall knowledge, uh, they helped to co-facilitate uh, at times, they helped to step in and engage in conversation. Uh, they helped to build sideboards uh, for uh, some of our planning, they help to uh, identify uh, some of the data needs and challenges that were, that, now this is the kind of leadership I'm talking about. It wasn't the kind of leadership that they were controlling this process. The control of the process was really from the local level and the state shows up as a convener, as a partner uh, to come alongside us and, and to build some Build some success. Now that that I'm really digressing into something that I think Peggy has already said. And I'll leap in really quickly just to respond. So uh, the local the local people have to feel that they have an ownership of the outcomes, and so that's why it's really important that they feel like they are really a part of the decision making. Again, I always go back to the state laws, the state rules, all have to be followed. But in all of the planning stuff that I have done in various areas, including land use, as well as, as water and other areas, it really takes um, local ownership of the process to be able to support the outcomes. Because it isn't just going to be that the state is going to be able to fund the outcomes. It may well be that people in the community have to come up with either some dollars or some new policies to make things work. And so um, so I guess I'm, I am less threatened by community led as long as the state is, as Al, a, Adam said, is a partner and making sure that the process continues to go uh, in, a, um, in a legal direction. So Kimberly and Oriana. Yeah, and I think you, you sort of hit the nail on the head. It is, it is the term community led um, that causes tension. And this is one of the many things that was identified in the place-based planning assessment as sort of a major issue. Um, Water Watch agrees that the community, you know, it is really critical in these place-based plans that the community is fully engaged, that they are at the table, that they feel invested, that there is a feedback loop into you know, this document. Um, so appreciate everything you know, Peggy and Adam have said. Um, I think we're coming from a perspective of you know, water is a public resource. It belongs to everyone in the state. This, you know, the water resources department is charged with managing that. There are other, you know, there are other water pieces too, you know, DEQ, ODF and W. Um, so, and I'm not, you know, I'm not sure we're actually saying different things because I think, you know, Adam, I agree with everything you said about, you know, sideboards, data needs, uh, convening, co-facilitating, 
we're, we're sort of not saying, we're, I think I'm hearing acknowledgement of the importance of the state role, but when the term community led is put into documents, it creates tension and confusion. Um, we've seen that firsthand in some of these place-based planning um, exercises we've been in where I would say different community members have different ideas of what community led means. Um, and I do, I really appreciate the work of the subgroup to define it um, because we actually, I think my comments were, we actually, we agree with the definition that they've put forth. It's just the title. Um, so we are suggesting, you know, that it be called something, you know, pivoted to like community engagement rather than community led. And I think, you know, this ties in, I think Nikki, you said nicely, um, you know, sometimes just on the engagement piece, even, you know, the community may not have the capacity. And so you may need state leadership there. And so if you use that term, it doesn't allow for that flexibility, especially in the way that this document is set up. There are a couple of places where it has community leadership, but then when you look at the framework, um, it says, it, it, this is under community engagement uh, recommendation B, it ties funding to, um, I think, adhering to these principles. So in other words, unless a place is led by a community, um, then they can't get funding. And anyway, I, I'm sort of muddling around, but I guess I think we're all on the same page about the importance of community engagement and the importance of the community feeling vested and the importance of bringing their knowledge and perspective to the table. It's just the terminology that is causing problems on the ground in our experience. Okay. And I just put in the chat the description that the group had around community led. Oriana. Yeah, um, I won't repeat some of the really excellent um, examples that Peggy and Adam both shared of like what community led can mean. I wonder, uh, Kimberly, and for others for whom this term is a sensitivity, whether community ownership bears the same problems or whether it helps alleviate like that stickiness around the word led. Um, because kind of the flip of that is engagement can sometimes have a negative connotation for community because it often means that there will be like a box check that like community will come and like, you know, get a, a public meeting or, you know, somewhere in the community, uh, an invite to that meeting is posted, but that there's not that kind of deeper accessibility or also that opportunity to have some ownership in the process. Um, Cause I think a lot of communities don't wanna engage if they feel like they don't have some impact on the potential outcomes. And those outcomes can be very collaborative. They can include community members from both the local context and the statewide context, but without that ownership, the process may not feel meaningful. And I think like finding a phrase, whether it's ownership or something else that helps communicate that there is that ability to, within the bounds of state frameworks um, and, and requirements, still be able to have an impact on outcomes and to be able to make the data requests or create that local context. Like, I think that 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 framing is very, very important for someone to recognize whether a process is likely to be meaningful or whether it is likely to feel more like, oh, we got engaged and then we never heard from anybody again. Um, so I think it's finding that sweet spot and not getting too much into semantics around what communicates ownership um, and collaboration, but doesn't tip over into either of the areas that feel uncomfortable for, for folks either on the ground or kind of working more in that protection of water as a public resource context at the state level. How does that sit with you, Kimberly? Is yeah, I, I am. So I appreciate um, that. I think it is it is really just a different phrase. Um, ownership, unfortunately, I think um, 
probably raises more concerns just because again, um, water belongs to everyone in the state. It doesn't, it doesn't, water itself does not belong to the community sitting on top of it. But you did say, I do, so I'm very open to um, trying to figure out a different phrase, but you did in your closing, Oriana, say community collaboration. Does that, does that capture it? I mean, I very much understand what you're trying to say, and that's a really interesting point on the word engagement. So I appreciate that. Um, so I didn't know if community collaboration would cut it. <laughs> And I'm not sure we need to work. So I, I'm wondering if um, we're, we're close. I really think we're close. Um, is there anyone else besides Kimberly, others that would be interested and willing to work with the task group to try to make some of these refinements? Because a lot of what you're saying is you're, you're going in the same direction. It's just wording. And I think it might also help us unstick the one sticky community engagement recommendation uh, around applying these as kind of a premise for funding place-based planning. So yeah, I, uh, go ahead, I'll do Jeff. it. I'll, I'll do it. I mean, okay. I mean I, I, but I have one last thing. I know I'm standing between us and lunch. That's so, okay. Let, um, me just, let me just double check. So Jeff's willing, Kimberly's willing, raise your virtual hand if you're willing to join the task group to, to try to button this up as a next step. And it's okay if you say no, Adam, you, you're on the group. So we have to, <laughs> we're not gonna let you go. <laughs> um, let me know after the meeting if you're interested and we will coordinate. I, I think this is really, really close. So, um, and I really appreciate Peggy flagging this, Kimberly flagging this as a, an important dynamic to work through and see if we can just get to the right level of framing that holds again holds the space for the things that you're that you care about in this um go ahead jeff so um first of all this thing's not compulsory so let's keep that in mind and i i look at it maybe because i'm a simpleton and i'm really hungry and i'm already thinking about for lunch but the grocery store checkout line is a metaphor for me so if we do place-based planning does that get you into the express lane doesn't say which line you have to get into. I mean, sometimes you're at 16. I know Peggy goes in when she has like 17 or 18 things. But I, the, but the question is, I mean, which which line do you get in? And so I, I just fail to see how getting the end result, which is what you want good policy to be, having on the front end a lot of local engagement. I mean, I, the reason I volunteer is because both Peggy and I have spent more time at Metro than, God, I, I will say, than anybody else on this call. I think that's a fair statement. But um, let's just remember, it's not compulsory. So if you want to choose this path, you can. Uh, so I'm hungry, so I'll stop talking. Okay. But what I don't yeah. want... What I don't want is to make sure, I'm sorry, but what I don't want is to have this kill the entire work that we're doing. And so if we have to do something to address this, then then I, then I we need to do it. That's just the critical part of it. Thank you, Peggy. Kaylin? Quick process check. Um, I know we want to go eat. Um, will we be coming back to close out the community engagement portion of the agenda after lunch, or is this our last bite at this apple? Well, I guess what I'm hearing, unless folks want to hurry over lunch and try to make some refinements and offer a proposal, which I'm totally game if you want to do that, we can come back after lunch and talk about it. Um, but without having that group get together and figure it out, we don't have a proposal on the table. So I don't think we can continue it, Kaylin. The unless one somebody that wants I... to bring a proposal forward. Well, I guess, sorry, Robin, the, there is a proposal on the deliberative agenda, and I wasn't sure if we were going to get to that. Well, let me, I guess, be clear about, I think the issue with that proposal on the table is that it's it's reflective of um, applying those guiding principles. And because Kimberly had concerns with the way the guiding principles were framed, saying community-led, um, it's a, it's not really, it's something that we have to get that piece taken care of before we can ask you all about this particular, um, application. Does that make sense? 
So the guide is the guide. It's a tool for groups to use. This in the straw proposal is actually a recommendation to say there would be criteria that would be reflective of these guiding principles um, for to, to, to help the state determine access to place-based planning funding. So it takes it a step further if that if that makes sense to you. And I think it's seems, the words resolved, we're gonna have a hard time going through that recommendation. I, I think it it's it's a trick from where I said it feels like a chicken and an egg struggle in that yes. where, how you define community then impacts how leadership um and engagement and collaboration flows. Um, so, uh, Nicely. <laughs> we ha had not, um, necessary, I don't think we had directly discussed the proposal that was on the table. And I, so I, I think, I mean, I, do I, you want to say something about the proposal? <laughs> I like it. I mean, I guess the thing that I, that I like about the proposal that is listed in the deliberative agenda is that, um, it provides a more expansive definition of what community is and um, would preclude the exclusion of um, people or interests who don't specifically live within the planning area. Um, all, I, it would frame all of the people with an interest in the place, how the water is planned for in the planning area as being the community. And um, that's so, what I like about it. Yeah, so that, I mean, just so you're, everybody's fought, tracking this, there's this proposal to reframe and then um, the definition of community. The only change, Kaylin, is it adds and ecosystems. The rest of that language is already in the guide. So um, yeah, I think you're right. If that's, if that's all it takes for you to get there, um, you know that's great. I think the the primary concern is this oh this umbrella tagline of community led. That was the the primary issue I think Kimberly was flagging. Well, I I guess I'm confused by the proposal which says move it to the straw document, and it's not in the straw, and it was in the straw before. So I'm getting lost in where we are in the process. All right, I think we need to take a lunch break and we'll come back to this. Um, Daniel, last thoughts and then we'll come back. Yeah, this may be minor detail, but this come up in several um, groups that I've been involved with. There's a statement in there that talks about people who live in the basin. Um, I would recommend adding people who live or work in the basin because they're gonna be people who maybe don't live in the basin, but whose jobs and livelihoods are dependent on water who actually work in the basin. So I just would recommend adding living or working. Okay, thank you. So I think to Kaylin's question, Kimberly, you were the one that flagged this as a particular concern. Um, others may have their own particular concerns around this, this idea of what community-led is. If you can reflect over the lunch break on this pairing of what community actually means and therefore what community led would mean who the community is and some of the description and explanation of what the task group just shared about what they're thinking was the intention behind it um could you live with you know would that be enough for you and others if you want to make a proposal of a different way to say community led that still meets the intent that was behind your work Please bring that back after the break. We'll spend three more minutes on this after the break, and then we have to move on to the other items for today. So with that, um, we're a little bit behind. Um, are folks okay if we if we do 20 minute lunch break? Anybody will come back at 105 as planned. And um, We'll check in on this and then we'll move on and we'll see you at 105. Thanks everybody for your hard work on this today. We can get, thank you. Um, apologies to those out in the public sphere who got a, an agenda that the timings, the timing is different than what we're working with right now. Uh, 
we had to do a little bit of retooling of the agenda just to accommodate the specific deliberative topics and also have a reasonable time for lunch. So um, that's why this is a little off. Just know that we will end at three <laughs> and we'll be spending the rest of our time uh, focused primarily on the pathways and process uh, recommendations and teeing up some of the deliberative topics that, that kind of nest within that section of the straw. Um, we will still check in on public comment toward the end of the meeting around 2.40, 2.45. Um, if anyone is interested in providing public comment, please reach out to Jenna Stillman, who my colleague from Oregon Consensus, uh, she can be tracking that and let us know uh, folks that are getting in the queue for that. So um, the invitation stands, but if you could and you're, you know you're going to want to provide comment, let her know so we have a tracking of that. Um, so with that, I, we um, we probably need to uh, do give some time for the task group and Kimberly and Jeff and anyone else that's interested to kind of massage some of the, the verbiage around the heading of what community led is. But I do think it's worth us doing a quick gut check on consensus, just a gut check on do we agree with, can we live with the descriptor language? So here's the first question, and um, we're going to do a, a poll in the Zoom on this. Um, I'm just going to tether us back to um, what community, how community is defined. And whether this stays in the guide or becomes part of the straw is part of your terms and definitions at the front. Let's we'll we'll figure out where it goes in your work, but let's just see if we agree on the description. So this would be the description of community. Um, is community can be, and, and Kelly put it in the chat. I'm going to put it back in the chat just in case you missed it. This is the description of community. Community can be, did I get that? There we go. People who live within the planning region, Entities with an interest or obligation. Oh, sorry. People who live, I'm going to, sorry, Dan, you, Daniel had suggested people who live or work within the planning region, entities with an interest or obligation relative to water and ecosystems in the region, people impacted by water planning in the region or water impacted downstream of the region and governments, federal, state, local, tribal. When we're thinking about community doing place-based planning, can we live with, do we agree with, do we support this description of what community is? That's the question on the table. It's a gut check. We're gonna use our five finger consensus tool, which is one, I enthusiastically support and agree with this description. Two, I'm good with it. Three, I'm neutral, I'm on the fence. I may have some minor concerns, but I'm fine. Four, I have serious questions or concerns with this, and I need to have those addressed. I would like to have those addressed. I'm not necessarily going to block this if we run out of time or we can't get to a better description. Five is no way I would not be able to live with this. So we're going to do the poll. Ecosystems is in there, Kimberly. It says, it says relative to water and ecosystems. Is that not where you wanted it? Yeah, I had suggested it also um, in the last sentence, in the last part of the sentence, people or ecosystems impacted by water planning. Oh, okay, so, okay. Let's just make sure we get it. People who work or live within the planning region. Entities with an interest or obligation relative to water and ecosystems in the region. People, is this where it is? People or ecosystems impacted? Yeah. People or ecosystems impacted by water planning in the region or water impacted downstream of the region. 
and governments. Federal, state, oops, local, tribe. I'm gonna wait and hit, hit, um, hold on one moment. We've got two of our work group members coming on. So I'm gonna hit this into the chat after they join so they can see it. While we're doing that, James Halliday, um, welcome to the group. Are you representing the Warm Springs tribe today? Yes, I am. Okay, so very much welcome. And sorry, we didn't catch uh, introducing you at the outset of the call. Okay, yeah, I'm James Halliday and I'm the Land Services Administrator for the Warm Springs Tribe. Thank you so much. Okay, here's our question. Do you agree with this description of community as it relates to the work that you're doing here for place-based planning? People who work or live within the planning region, entities with an interest or obligation relative to water and ecosystems in the region, people or ecosystems impacted by water planning in the region or water, sorry, not a double water, impacted downstream of the region and governments, federal, state, local, tribal. On a scale of one to five, we're gonna do a poll. And only work group members should participate in this. <laughs> Please do not participate if you're not a work group member. Do we have all of our work group members covered? Okay, nope, we don't, let's keep going. Robin, this is Caitlin Barter, I had one question. Um, it seems in the community engagement guide that it, like community led, for instance, is followed by means that, and then it gives the definition. Here That'll we have- be our Next question. That's our okay. next definition. Okay. okay. Well, on. no, I'm Hold not. On. I didn't. Uh, no, I'm not jumping to that one. What okay. I'm asking is, this is phrased as community can be, and I was curious if it was, if it's community can be or community means or community includes. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Like it, it, those, those can mean different things. So again, if you have serious concerns or want to say something about that, let's get there. But let's just figure out if a general description of community works for people. And then you can flag that question if that's a concern for you. Um, are you a four on this? Where is this a serious concern for you? Well, I don't know. I guess I, um, based on what had been typed into the chat of people who live, work, et cetera. I was, I'm good with that, but I think um, I, for me, I would just want to have it be that community means that, okay. uh, that it necessarily community can be, if that makes okay. sense. So who, we have two fours, does, do the fours want to come forward with what your serious concerns or questions are on this? We have a moderate to weak consensus on this right now, given that we have two fours. So who, which fours want to come forward? Margaret. Uh, yes, um, the community can be that, that concerns me. And I, I guess I need some explanation on people or ecosystems impacted. I mean, we already have um, an uh, ecosystem in the previous uh, um, statement. So it, I mean, an ecosystem really can't come forward itself. It would have to be somebody who's 
interested in the ecosystem or has an interest or obligation to. So I don't understand the including the ecosystems in that. So what, how would you reframe can be to get you to a higher than a four? <clears throat> Uh, well, it either is or it isn't. Kind okay. Of, I mean, community, yeah, community is, is more. Okay. Or, I mean, if we're going to put sideboards on something, um, the sideboards have to. It's more it. assertive. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Alan, I think that was your question too. Um, Kimberly, quick response on why, what was meant by. Yeah. And this, this goes back <coughs> to. Uh, I've stated this on the record a few times, I mean, it's on the record, so it's a longstanding conversation, um, primarily with uh, Tom Beiler, who's not here to cooperate, but he would use the word community oftentimes in these discussions, and we would say, community, does that, you know, in our mind, it needs to include ecosystems because that's part of their place-based place planning, and he said, yes, community includes ecosystems, so that's why I am always just putting it in there, okay. so it's clear. That it's um, not just people. I mean, it is in there already. It's just it's not that's not a huge point if it's at least in one spot. But I'm just it's a just trying to continue that thread forward. Okay. And then I got a private message from somebody who said they accidentally put a four and actually are a three. So I think we have a four and the rest are threes, twos, and ones. So with that, we're going to move on, and then we're going to double check on. This idea of community led, which the phraseology might change, that's going to go to the task group. But if you were thinking about the description of community empowered or community ownership or some version of what it means to have the community be in a leadership role in this work, would be um, up here. Community, sorry. I'm sorry. There it is. This is the description as it's as it's written. So it's let's not let's soften our gaze on the the header, but really, what's the description of what we mean by this, or what the task group was intending? Again, one through five on this on this verbiage. Community members. So community, we've defined. We've got that de description of community who represent local and dispersed statewide communities impacted by process, are engaged at the outset, asked to define values and outcomes for a process, and empowered to take ownership to shape the process and its ultimate outcomes. So on this description, where might you be? This is a gut check. Okay. We're gonna do the poll again. I percent both local and dispersed statewide communities impacted by a process are engaged. You, just so you know, Margaret, you are not on mute if you're trying to be Thank on you. Mute. <laughs> Sorry. I think we're looking for 17 responses. All right, so again, we have we do have a 
basically a consensus, but a few strong concerns or questions. Again, the fours that want to come forward with a, what your concern is and a potential reframe. Go ahead, Caitlin. Thanks, Robin. Um, a potential reframe uh, would be to leave the words community members and then possibly strike who represent both local and dispersed statewide communities because I think that that's included within the definition of community and um I mean I just to throw out the you know that the five percent argument would be there may be place-based planning processes that include um or th that should include community from honestly outside Oregon um depending on the downstream or upstream impacts of a process so um it may be that again that might be the the five percent off ramp um but just throw that out there for consideration thank you Margaret I guess that I'm a bit dense because I don't really understand what this is trying to tell me. So if somebody can give me a little bit of an explanation who represent both local and dispersed statewide communities. Well, uh, I mean, just about anybody could come up with that and that they're asked to define values and outcomes for a process and empowered to take ownership. I mean, there are lots of words that are words that just kind of are, I don't have a lot of real uh, um, definitive meaning to me at least. Which task for I don't, and I don't have, uh, I don't have a reframing at this moment in time. Okay. Quick response from one of our task group members on that to help contextualize this for Margaret. Well, I would say, unless somebody wants to weigh in, um, Margaret, maybe start with going back to the community engagement guide that's where it shows up and there may be some context setting for you there and we will rest with that you have some kind of confusion questions around this just not really sure what it's intended to be here um and i think um with that i'm just gonna put all well, this whoop yeah so i mean are we talking concentric circles here are we talking about if Let's say it's in Deschutes County and I'm in Multnomah County. Do I have equal standing I'm trying to do that? I mean, that's that, I mean, that that's how I read it, but of course, you know, I'm have limited intellect. I'm just trying to figure out where where what is what is local? What is, I mean, kind of what what far reaching how, how far reaching is it? Um, because I think the planning, I think the intent is for the planning to be done in a more localized fashion, unless I'm misreading what place part of place-based planning is. Peggy? Well, I guess I'm struggling with, um, does it really matter if I'm in Multnomah County and I'm participating in the Deschutes process. So long as what I'm bringing to the table relates to the charter or the goal or the purpose of the group. Well, I, I, I would actually, Peggy, if I might, I mean, respectfully, yeah. um, I mean, the point is to try to get local buy-in not not to have the city of portland opine if that's a good or bad thing for deschutes county i think you're good you're gonna open up a big old can of unintended consequence later on when the legislature overreacts 
to that potentially. I just, to me, I'd rather have, I'd rather have folks who are more centrally engaged than like nurseries getting involved in something that would be in Pendleton. Even if, if I have a member there, great you know, impacts our, our industry, but overtly, I mean, Canby doesn't have a whole lot in common with uh, Pendleton. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I'll just speak from experience in the district. We have statewide groups at the table, including Water Watch, and find it incredibly important to make sure that we're building consensus with statewide interests that have um, a public interest in water under the law. And so I think the water and ecosystems piece extending beyond that local basin is really important. Um, and I'm, I'm a little confused on, I feel like we just covered this in the community <laughs> definition and now we're kind of recovering it. So I'm not exactly sure what, Margaret, what your question was confused about. I'm trying to figure out how to help and I don't, I, I think this was more about what engagement means versus who community is in this, in this example. Yeah, yeah. So, so that we don't revisit and rehash this definition of community, because we already did the conversation on that, recognizing that there are still concerns, recognizing, Jeff, your, your piece around local buy-in being really important. Um, the flip side of that, as we understand it from the conversations in this work group, is that also you can't leave people out. You can't leave people out who have an interest in that conversation. So it's both and. And I, I I respectfully disagree. I respectfully disagree. I I, I it's it's at least it's just my opinion now that you know I I think having that local localized effort. I mean, not just because it's a drop of water and the state owns all the water doesn't mean that you know your ability to weigh in on something that is clearly not in your area. Maybe that's part part of the reason that statewides might have a have an issue uh there. But I'm a statewide organization. I wouldn't even think about weighing in in, in Lake County. Um so I just I just I don't I don't understand where the lack of trust is on the local side. And if that's what we're talking about here is just allow every person to have Standing. I mean, what's what's the purpose of place-based planning other than to try to control it from the top? I just don't like it. Chandra and Dan, and then I, I respectfully am going to say we're going to move to the next topics. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you call my name, Robin? Or no, Kimberly, Chandra, and Dan, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I guess I just want to bring back the conversation to. The original discussions around in the 2012 integrated water resources strategy, um, the word place based was very, very, very purposeful to focus attention on the unique hydrology of a certain water basin and the water challenges facing that basin. Um, the word place was used because there was an understanding that there are interests throughout the state and beyond that do care about water in that place. It's, it is, again, the local you know, participation engagement is critical to these discussions, but there are people, you know, organizations, government agencies, et cetera, who do have an interest in the water resources of that place. So I think, you know, there's sort of, I guess I would just say, um, you know, I would point us back to sort of the umbrella term of these planning issues, because I think that captures it well. Chandra? Yeah, I just wanted to um, support Kaylin's suggestion. I think that, you know, we did just, I think reach consensus on what community means. So if you just start this section by communities impacted by a process are engaged at the outset, then we do avoid having to, I guess, understand what those two first sentences mean. And then also this conversation about whether statewide or local communities should be engaged in a process. It really does tie back to our definition of communities. And that can include, 
I think, statewide interest when it's relative to water and ecosystems in the region, their interest is. And that, I think we just resolved that. So I guess I just put a plug to support Caitlin's suggestion. Dan? Yeah, I just want, Kimberly, Kimberly really said it. It's really based on the place. It's placed on the basin. And that in and of itself actually informs a lot of the aspect of which communities and who's gonna be involved and all that stuff, because you're really talking about a specific geographic area and that's kind of really, really more most important. And if in fact, you're running a nursery organization and there aren't any nurseries there, you don't care, then that's great, you don't care. You don't show up. And that, that's practically speaking what's gonna happen. So um, I, I just don't think it's an issue to get too worked up about. All right, so um, ongoing healthy tension around who should be and who's gonna be and who has control and all of those things really is a healthy part of tension in this, in this particular conversation around place-based planning, which is by design, trying to be a partnership amongst a, a bunch of different people collaboratively working through planning issues. Um, so all of that said, I think we do have some general consensus on a few items that would be, be some substantive work for the task group to kind of take back into your guide and for us to bring back forward in the form of any community engagement recommendations for community engagement. Um, we're not going to resolve that all today, but I do appreciate the how this conversation has progressed um, in some ways progressed to get you a little bit further along on some of these really sticky and important values conversations that you're having. Um, and let's move to our next segment, and that would be on um, the process and pathways. So we haven't talked a lot, of, a lot about all of these. And so we didn't, I do have a few that are related to specific proposals that people put into their worksheet responses, but some of this is teed up as discussion point. So I'd like you to just take it as it is. We're teeing these up as what should be the right pathway or thing forward. And that will inform very likely inform some uh, refinements to the process and pathways recommendations on the whole. Um, so the first one is around, you know, it's really a question of like recognition or qualifying for place-based planning funding. There's a recommendation A in the thing, and this is um, a refined, is kind of a combination refined proposal from a few of the comments in the worksheet. Um, and it says, establish a framework or prioritization protocol for the state to determine which basins qualify for place-based planning funding. The state should make these investments if place-based planning is identified as the best tool for addressing the water needs of that geography and should not mandate support for any interested basin. The state should prioritize investment of these funds based on the level of need and opportunity for success using a place-based planning approach. So the kind of question on the table is, does that seem right? Should there be a more explicit framework or prioritization protocol that would be an evolution of, of the programming? Because right now there's a certain, there were certain protocols establishing who got selected for the pilots, but this would be um, saying something more explicit about that. Dan? Is that my cue to stop talking and let the work group talk? <laughs> yeah, it's not really a suggestion so much, but it's preliminary to that, just to make sure it doesn't foreclose the discussion of having the possibility of some kind of tiered levels of participation. So rather you're not just in or out, it might be you are, are going to have a pathway to get funding to build your capacity. You're gonna have funding um, the, the analogy would be with Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, OWEB has capacity grants, OWEB has technical assistance grants, which are smaller usually or easier to get. Um, and they don't necessarily guarantee that you're gonna get project funding eventually. And I just don't wanna preclude the possibility to have that kind of a, a tiered level of recognition and assistance. Um, to get involved with the program. 
on that. So it's just just to not have that ruled out. Just saying, you know, you're in or you're out. You might be in on a on a certain phase. And the only other specific point might be, and, and this came up from today's discussion a bit, is the word the best tool. You're finding that it's the best tool. Maybe just finding it's a tool for addressing the the water. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if we want to have best in there. So that's kind of to the big general one, and then maybe specific on that. So I know one of our work group members is not here who brought part of this kind of thinking forward. Um, <clears throat> who else provided some proposal around this? That would like to kind of share your thoughts around what was what's intended behind it, Kimberly. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, mine was much more general. I just suggested that we have some sort of um, framework for prioritizing. Uh, place based you know, who would get the grants for place-based planning. And that emerged from, you know, as I was reading through the document, it appeared to direct that basically any community that came to the state would get funding. Um, and I think we've heard from a number of folks over these past months, um, and it's also in the place-based planning assessment that not place-based planning is not really the tool for every basin. Some basins, it's a good fit. Some basins, we need data in place first, um, you know, et cetera. So it was just basically trying to give the state a pathway for undertaking a reasonable workload under place-based planning. Um, because I don't, I don't, you know, one, the state doesn't have the resources to do 20 place-based plans at once, um, but two, not every basin is ready. Three, not every basin needs a place-based plan. I'm sure there's more, but. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. That, that was really one of my concerns. And I really, I like Dan's comment about the tiered layers of participation, whatever, because I do see that there are some smaller opportunities. Uh, but I do believe that the, the agency needs some guidance, uh, some criteria in order to help um, select um, the, uh, using the amount of money that they are, are given, one hopes they are given money, um, to be able to figure out how they should best spend their money on behalf of all Oregon related to water. Other conversation about this one? Okay, I'm gonna put in the chat uh, just some a slight modification to this, the one that's in the deliberative. Go ahead, Kaylin, before I do that. Thanks, I uh, accidentally hit share screen, so I'm glad that didn't work out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nothing too bad on here. Um, I think one, one thought I had on this was, um, I believe it was the place-based planning evaluation used the term situational assessment to describe not only kind of assessing water supply and demand, but also social readiness capacity. And, um, I think that's in my mind, those are related, but separate processes. Um, and it seems like doing a, a basin assessment looks at your water situation. And then if a group wants to engage or is interested in engaging, or the state thinks that a region might be interested in engaging in place-based planning, there is a social 
there could be a social assessment, like a social readiness. It feels also like there's a lot of a um, lot wrapped up into an assessment of a social readiness, and it, it um, that feels like a real sticky sticky wicket um, that I don't want to gloss over. Um, anytime there's a state determination of whether a community is ready to undertake place-based planning, it feels like that's one that we really want to um, tread carefully on. That's it. Right. Other comments, thoughts? Let's look at this slight reframe or refinement, not even a reframe, it's a refinement. Um, uh, let's start with Peggy though, and then you guys can read, y'all can read this. I'm sorry, I just really, I just want to focus on the last sentence. The okay. state should prioritize investment in these funds based on the level of need and the opportunity for success. And it seems to me that those are pretty good guidance without being overly specific for the agency. So you like that, you like that framing? Well, it's the last sentence of the, uh, in the, uh, in the recommendation. Right. So I was focusing, I wanted people to really oh. sort of focus their, focus their eyes on that part. Yes, there's all these other verbiage things there, but the truth is that it's that last sentence that really gives them the guidance that I think is reasonable. Okay. Adam? And Kaylin, oops, yikes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, and I'm going back to something that Dan said. Uh, and while I, uh, Dan, I generally believe that uh, place-based planning is the best tool for this process, it's it's not a statement that I think we can support, or or that I can support <clears throat> uh, for this group. I I think I think it could be better said that place based planning identifies a successful tool, but perhaps it's not the best tool. I don't, I'm not sure how that will fit with others, but yeah, I know we've seen some experiences um, uh, has proven that it is a successful tool. Uh, so maybe the rest of the group might agree to that. Okay, Kaylin. Um, I like Peggy's drawing uh, her attention to the last sentence, and I just want to ask a question. Um, I think we would uh, we would probably all agree that prioritizing funds to places with a high level of likely success in place-based planning approach would be good. I think the first part of the sentence is the maybe the one we haven't spent time on, which is um, I can see a situation where there's not enough money and you could either throw all of the money at the one place with a very high level of need, or you could um, distribute it across 20 places that have low level of need. Um, and which one is the, the best approach? You know, which one is fair, which one is equitable? And I don't think that we've spent the time talking about what we think is the right prioritization framework. Um, so just wanted to flag that as um, another sticky wicket, sorry. What do you think, Kaylin? Oh, um, so I'm an attorney and the answer is always it depends, right? Um, so uh, if funding availability was not a issue in um, this Nirvana world uh, that doesn't exist, then I would say um, everybody gets everything they need, right? Um, and we could kind of just set that aside, but I think just looking at reality, we're, we're never going to have, and I guess if you look at the last round of funding that was first offered for these four place-based planning pilots, like there was this very small amount of money 
and a huge level of interest such that the state ended up trying to support even more pilots than they had originally envisioned. So that's kind of the reality that I would see continuing. Um, it's, it's a sad situation, but I just think that if, I, I guess it, it's just, um, it would be, I don't wanna have to be putting myself in the role of the grant, you know, the, I guess, whoever oversees the, the water, the plant face space planning, I guess, water resources commission of deciding who gets these um, based on like a speculative amount of money that's available. Um, if 20 places can do it with a little money, but maybe could get other funds for it, and then maybe you give it all that one group that really, really needs it. Um, I don't know. These are really tough policy decisions, though. So let me ask you, Kaylin, and I do see your hand as well, Margaret, but Dan Thorndike was making a suggestion that you would actually design it so there's kind of a tiered thing. Um, so in that scenario, Dan, would it be that maybe one area gets a lot of funding for a lot of the plea? I don't know how this would actually, and again, we're none of us are doing program, grant program design right now, but we are talking about should there be a framework or prioritization protocol? Is there anything else you want to say about that? But I just wonder, Kaylin, if in your concerns, approaching it was as a kind of a tiered, you know, design, would that make sense? Would that be something that would at least in part address some of your questions of concern around equity as well as finite amount of resources to go to place-based planning? I want to... Um... To kick it back over to Dan um, to maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you know your point's really right too. It depends on how much money. I mean, this is this is the history of OWeb. It's the history of GWeb. I mean, so GWeb before OWeb it was really pilot programs because it didn't have much money. You give it a bunch of money, and it has continually wrestled with the same issue. How do you get the how do you be fair? How do you get the best effects? It's an ongoing thing. And I don't think we're gonna be able to dictate the exact way that that's done. I think we just have to allow the, you know, whatever the process that goes forward is, is gonna to have to deal with that and just have the sideboards that, that indicate those things. And I think in, to that extent, that, that notion of sort of the tiered model to some degree allows just something that, and I don't, this language may not even preclude it. I can read it one way or the other um, to just allow that flexibility because we won't know until people start coming up with what they need and how much money there is. But that's, you know, we just don't want to have something that, that creates obstacles to that flexibility when we're making a recommendation is all I'm really saying. But then I'm a lawyer too. I mean, I get wishy washy. Margaret? I'm not a lawyer, I'm a practitioner. Um, uh, and I would say that uh, it would be very difficult to prioritize uh, on the level of need and their opportunity for success. I mean, you'd have to have some pretty solid criteria to make those judgments. Um, uh, perhaps if we come up with a number and uh, say $150,000 for your initial foray into place-based planning for any group and see if we can get the legislature to, to fund that for um, all 36 counties or all 19 regions or some, some sort of dollar amount that could be equitably discharged around the state for everyone to take advantage of this opportunity. Pete? Uh, yeah, just following up on Dan's comments a little bit as often being an OWEB applicant dealing with that system, I think um, that's a, you know, putting a prioritization in place for a pot of funding and then you let the grants come in, the proposals come in, and we're we're very used to that. You know, we we have a recommendation of funds do not fund, and then there's a funding line, and so 
there's even some groups recommended for funding that don't get the funding in that year. And so that kind of straddles maybe the prioritization and the pragmatism of if you could build in some criteria based on, ideally you would have a statewide situation assessment for every basin that sort of assesses the water scarcity, water management issues, because that's probably the first place the state wants to invest in. Um, and then you layer that with a community who's interested in participating and less concerned about like whether they're totally ready or not, because a lot of communities get ready by doing the work, as long as they have some resources to do the work and there's a will and there's a state need to do that work. So I think some of this could be built into a funding program. Um, and then ideally we just continue to grow that pot of funding, but you know, when there are hard decisions that have to be made, they're based on some prioritization. Daniel. Yeah, these are all good, important topics to consider. Um, I think though that for our group's purposes, I'm not sure we can really get into discussion of the details of how the prioritization is going to go on. And I think maybe if we say, hey, is need an opportunity for success? Are those the two most important things that we think that the uh, agency people are going to need to consider when they do the ranking criteria. Maybe that's what we should consider. I mean, is there anything else that's really big, like level of need and opportunity for success that we need to put in here? Or is that good? Because, um, you know, just from having been on uh, grant decision boards and, and things like that, it's a tremendously complicated process. And there's no way I think we're going to be able to do anything here. So that's just my my two cents and you know let's make sure we capture what we think are the really high high level broad brush important things that the agency should consider when they do their criteria ranking i'm going to go out on a limb and say i heard in the conversation potentially one around roughly vaguely uh, equitable distribution or something like that so i don't know if that's another consideration that the group wants to <clears throat> you know, consider putting in. I'm seeing some, nope, and I'm seeing some maybe. Um, so to Daniel's question, are there other kind of high level considerations that you would want to be considered in developing a prioritization protocol? Peggy? Well, the thing, as, as I've been listening to everybody, I realized that level of need can be the level of need to address a water crisis or the level of need due to um, access to resources or lack of access to resources. Um, so I just wanted to throw that along. I'm not sure that equitable, um, yeah. that would mean every, you know, I can see where that fits in lots of places. I'm just not sure. And instead I see this as being a rulemaking exercise. You've given, we've given them some broad general comments and eventually in order to, to uh, distribute any dollars, they're gonna have to have specific, more specific criteria that they measure when they give out the money. And Thank I don't you. think we need to do that. Thank you. I think Daniel was, was basically saying that as well. That we won't get down to that level of prioritization criteria, but Kimberly. Yeah, just to tie the thread between what Daniel and Peggy said, maybe we just say including but not limited to, and then have those. Okay. Should we look at a potential here? <laughs> um, Let's look at the chat. This is a, a little bit of a refinement based on the conversation so far. Establish a framework for prioritization protocol, or I'm sorry, establish a framework or prioritization protocol, a situational assessment related to readiness for the state to determine which basins qualify for place-based planning funding. State should make these investments if place-based planning is identified as an appropriate tool or a successful tool, I think was another way, but uh, an appropriate tool for addressing the water needs of that geography. 
and should not mandate support for any, any interested basin. The state should prioritize investment of these funds based on including but not limited to the level of need and opportunity for success using a place-based planning approach. Um, I threw in here Dan's suggestion of using a tiered approach to allow for flexibility. I don't know if that's really capturing it well, but the intention of what Dan was suggesting around, you know, creating some flexibility within this um, to meet unique needs of that great of that group. A CEO web grant program approach as an example. So in spirit, maybe not perfectly worded, but in spirit, um, let's see where your gut check is on this. Nikki, if you don't mind putting yours into the poll, if you can, if not, we see you. Oh, thank you, Nikki. All right. Last call for work group members to plug in your level of gut check agreement on this. <clears throat> oh, I think we're missing Anna. Anna had to leave right at two, so she's not able to weigh in on this one. All right, so we've got, we're kind of all over the map here. Um, we do have two fives, which would indicate this wouldn't be a consensus recommendation at this point as written. Um, and one four who would say, I have, would have serious concerns or questions with this. So can I invite the, the fours and fives to come forward and help the group understand your concerns? And if you have suggested proposals to reframe to get you to a higher level of agreement. I was a five. Uh, I just, I guess I just instinctively react uh, to the state telling a community if they're ready or not. I think the community needs to come forward. I just, I just didn't like how it was framed, Robin. So um, no reason to put more words in there that are, than that are needed. Yikes, I was on mute. Um, thank you for saying that, Jeff. And, and before we bring other comments forward, I do wanna just refer you to the um, deliberative agenda. There's a discussion point that's queued up there that I think asks a question about this, which is if you, the group were to recommend that the state establish a framework for it to determine the basins that qualify, is it feasible within this recommendation to consider that a local group could approach the state to request to review for readiness an opportunity for success and or the state in conducting its own assessment could on its own determine that a place is or is, is not ready and therefore I, help I like I like the first part I don't like the second part uh, if they need the help they should be able to ask for it again I'm looking for a continuum of funding largely if we're looking at a state funded process uh, that can incorporate the planning part, the feasibility part and the project part. Um, to me that they're all, they all have varying degrees of complexity, um, but I just, I don't want to be 
on a whim of who's in control of the legislature about which things get funded and what areas get funded. Peggy. Can I ask a, a question, Jeff? I guess I, I'm not sure I'm hearing you right, and it may be simply my lack of, of understanding what you're saying. Um, it could be my lack of understanding of what I'm saying, Peggy. <laughs> well, that could, that could be the case, Jeff. I, we have this problem sometimes. But uh, what I thought this was is that if the state is going to be for providing funding for a place-based issue, they have to have the criteria, they have to have some role in whether or not they provide the money. And so I'm not sure, I, I hear your concern that the state not be in control of your uh, MOU or charter or whatever it is that you're going to do to decide what you're doing, but they really are the ones providing the money, at least we hope. At least some of it. I mean, uh, I, you know, I look, this might be a giant trip around the track and Nikki, Nikki Iverson, who's the great nursery whisperer can tell me that I'm wrong. Um, but I, it might not mean anything in the end. Right. But I, I think technical help in trying to try to get the adequate resources to do a proper plan. Again, I don't think you don't get all the way through if you take shortcuts. So that's, I think, just being overly prescriptive on the front end overly complicates it. And what I would, what I fear is if we make it overly complicated for a community to come together about what their needs are, then by the time we get to the funding part, there's, they're going to be all over the place uh, to, in order to see it through. That's, that's my point, Peggy, and maybe that's not very cogent, but that's what you get with me. So your your major concern, Jeff, is around um, that the state would identify the be that it's the best tool for addressing the water needs of that geography. That that should be something that the local group would determine. My hope is that we would be over prescribed with requests for place based planning. I mean that we really there's a there's so much there we have to really make investments. But I, I just, it's whether or not it bubbles up or is top down. And that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Do you, can I just ask, do you think there should be some protocol for the state to make those determinations? I guess help the group if there's some way to frame mm -hmm. this that. Yep. Uh, well. Sure. And I'm happy to do the, the, the work on this uh, to try to help get from here to there. My my point is that some will have varying degrees, some basins will have varying degrees of complexity, right? I mean, water's complicated anyway, but the bigger the basin, the more complex it can be. Um, but I, I just wanna make sure that there's common denominators uh, that, you know, these smaller communities who put people and use in kind, I mean, that people cost money as, a, as an exec. I could tell you that every one of my employees costs money no matter what they do. So let's put them in the right place at the right time to get the outcomes that we want. So that's kind of the global way that I look at that. And I'm, I'm not making much sense now. I can read your body language. It's cool. <laughs> doesn't matter if I get you or not. It matters if it gets you. Adam well, if I you. get me and I'll disagree <laughs> with myself. Beavers. Adam and Nikki. Thank you, uh, Robin and uh, Jeff. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to try to turn you around on this uh, because I'm sensitive uh, to what you're saying as, as well. Um, but I, but I also think there needs to be uh, a pre-qualification process, and I think this this gets us there. I agree. There's some finessing that we may need to do. Uh, to to gain consensus, but any any program uh, the state uses for funding the federal government, that, that likewise, it, there is typically a pre-qualification process, 
Uh, this doesn't seem too onerous. It does allow uh, communities to meet that pre-qualification, if you will, if, if I could just use that for a moment, uh, to gain the kind of funding. I, I'm like you, I think, I think that, uh, you know, we're gonna see uh, a day uh, in the not too distant future where uh, many, perhaps all the communities and basins within the state are going to be competing for this funding. And, and I think, uh, you know, uh, the state is going to have a lot of work to do to find this funding to support these efforts because we're at the threshold where uh, we need this now. Um, that perhaps we should have been doing this 10 years ago, 20 years ago, to meet the kind of needs that are upon us uh, that we're seeing uh, as a result of uh, climate conditions, uh, drought, water scarcity, uh, infrastructure uh, that is failing all around us. There is, there is so much need. Um, and so when, where there's need, there's, there's there's the, the need for funding. Uh, there's a need for planning, there's a need for funding, uh, then there's a need for implementation. And, and in order to do that, or inherent in that process, Jeff, and I, I, I know you get this, uh, you know, it's going to be competitive. And, and where that co competition lies, you're, you're going to have, yeah, perhaps it is uh, a WRD, uh, and the commission that is making decisions with, with respect to uh, who qualifies here, but that qualification process is going to be something that is there. I don't think it, I don't think it uh, dictates how well qualified a community can be in their process of engaging and approaching the state with that need. I think, I think that every community will have that flexibility. Um, anyways, I'm, I'll, Give the floor over to Nikki. I'm sure she'll say something more intelligent than I do. Um, I think I would. What I don't like is the phrase. Um, I think we should delete a situational assessment related to readiness. Um, I don't know what that means. <laughs> and if I'm an applicant, I think we're asking the department to develop protocols. And I agree with Adam, like when you apply for federal loans or grants or if you apply to OEB, generally they have criteria they go through and those criteria are published and you can set, decide before you spend a bunch of time putting together an application, decide to go into this big effort, whether you would rank well on those criteria. And those criteria, you know, could be you know, maybe certain fish flows aren't being met, water quality, water rights, you know, are limited and wouldn't be, you know, maybe the basin's over allocated different times of the year. I think there's pretty basic things that are driving us to even have these conversations. So um, I think the department should develop criteria um, that they would apply um, when they made a prioritization. And so I, I think if you just deleted the situational assessment, um, I think that would be better because I'm not, I, I think kind of back to Kaylin's question, like like social, all that other stuff. Like, I don't think applicants will really understand what any of that means because I don't really get it. So, but if there's like really clear criteria for prioritization that the department develops based on the issues of all, like why are all, why are all of us at the table? <laughs> I think if there's kind of criteria around those issues and, people hit those boxes, um, then I, you know, I think that that should rank and maybe one of the boxes is whether a base has been funded or not already, or, you know, I think there's water availability issues that should be, you know, you know, is that a constraint in the base? Seems to be that's the biggest issue we're all talking about <laughs> um, that results in different people needing to come to the table, whether that's infrastructure for fish, for water quality, um, but I think criteria would be good. And, you know, it seems like a lot of work, but, um, you know, the feds, you go through kind of two phases of application for every grant or loan process. You, 
you submit a letter of interest um, and then they rank it based on you know, criteria. And then if you meet those criteria, you have a second phase of submitting a, a more detailed application. I don't know if we want to go through that or if we just want to post the criteria that the department will be selecting basis for. Like maybe you're matching with staffing in kind, you know, and that might rank you higher. Um, maybe you're in a wildfire area or just some kind of disaster area where we need. I, I think there's pretty, I think the department is, has enough professional best management practices that they could come up with some criteria. But I think if you just took a deleted the situational assessment, I'm guessing from Jeff, that's the part that might make people like, if people are even interested, um, do they really need someone to come and tell them, are you interested? <laughs> are you really ready? I think if you just have criteria, you know, people, are, people can decide whether they want to invest in the system. I guess to me, if you just deleted that piece, the rest of it is good. So Jeff, let's check in with Jeff on that. And then we'll there's go a, to there's that. a reason that uh, she's this more articulate person. And I mean, that's largely where the, the rub was for me. So I, I look at how federal and state funding can intertwine. And so I just want to make sure that we do not um, inhibit uh, that ability for a good plan to go forward. Okay. Oriana? Yeah, I do just want to make the point that there are a lot of communities that don't go for federal funding or don't go for certain kinds of situations because they kind of self-select themselves out with criteria sometimes when they when they shouldn't. So I wonder if there's an option here to not just say like place-based planning funding, but also and tech or technical assistance and identify are there communities that are maybe not quite within kind of the the right criteria for place-based planning for whatever reason, but might be able to get there. And that of course doesn't account for like, what are the issues they're facing or what are the conditions in the basin? Those kinds of things that can't necessarily be changed without a lot of effort, depending on what the issue is. But I also wanna make sure that there isn't a set of criteria that gets put in place that leads to yeah. like a less resourced community not doing the work or yeah, feeling I, I, like they can't qualify. Like that's the one thing I want to flag because a lot of communities say, oh my, they got like a federal grant application and they say, wow, this seems like way too much work. We don't have the capacity. So I think I want to just be conscious of that, that the criteria get designed in a way that um, are inclusive or provide a, hey, here's a way to get help to get ready to yeah. do this. So, so Ariana, you're picking up what I'm putting down uh, on, on that, that I think if you had a pre-consulting apparatus, uh, that a community who would express an interest could could call into water resources and or get the technical expertise in order to assist you through um, something that would seem daunting, uh, especially if you're not used to doing it or under resourced. My my whole point is that this sh this should be fairly agnostic about how much money you have or where you're located. What I want, it's my opinion that what we want is. A good plan and so uh especially if the state's involved so that's i i'm with you on that and maybe maybe i i seemed more ogreish than i intended um but that's that's um i'm picking up what you're putting down thanks oriana and i don't know if there's um any potential refinement of this that you'd want to see that um you know, I think there's part of the group is saying, let's not go into like level the details of the criteria. But what I'm hearing you say is set it up so it's not prohibitive to those groups that might have high need, but um, aren't like well established as a collaborative yet or something like that. Um, so if there's something that you want to refine in this, um, make a proposal um if it's a flag for let's just make sure we're considering this we'll absolutely get it in the notes as well oh thank you okay so which may benefit from technical assistance okay kelly had her hand up we'll let people sit with this refinement for a moment go ahead
<laughs> I really yeah. wanted to hear what you were saying, and I was yeah. lip read. So God. Jeff Stone was right about everything, and oh, yeah, right. Um, no, I was just wondering if this was like any of this is in our purview. I'm wondering like how you. I mean, you just sort of stated it, but it it feels to me like we don't get to establish criteria, and we don't get to. It feels like we're going into this granting guidelines and um, not necessarily like a point of entry. It feels like. Um, yeah, like we're getting maybe too prescriptive in like what the criteria is or what it isn't or who gets to say, but it seems to me like, is that even, my question is, is that even in our purview? Like, do we get to determine any of that? Or can we just, you know, do we just lay out that there are these levels of, which again, Dan said it beautifully earlier, like with the OWEB model of, you know, you're, you're setting up to enter into a, like, and this captures her technical assistance question too, that Oriana, it's like some people are here and some people are here. And so I think even just the piece at the bottom that says when you added in a tiered approach, like, can we suggest by just saying like possibly a tiered approach, does that capture all this? Cause that allows an entry point at different levels for everyone. So I don't know. It just, it feels like a whole lot of details that I'm like, I, I don't know how much we have say in, I guess. Yeah, and way to go, Jeff Stone. <laughs> well, I have a concern about the actual fund and budgeting and all of that. Sorry about that. That's part of my area of work. And if we add, I, I get Ariana's uh, comment and the need. I'm just concerned about whether that be this belongs in the place-based planning funding discussion. Um, and it's just a, a general budgeting issue because there will be, there will be a fund created that will then need to be defined by the legislature. Go ahead, Oriana. Yeah, so a lot of funding opportunities have both like a, a central funding category and then like a planning grant opportunity. I wonder, and this might be getting us too far abroad, so someone should definitely correct me if that's the case, but I think where I'm getting at with the technical assistance side is just identifying like, what are the criteria for like that centralized, like going into the full on place-based planning process or doing a project or whatever that fund eventually covers. And then those who need like uh, some resources for a planning grant and some of that startup money that may be necessary to build the capacity in the community to to do the work. Um, I'm not sure if that's kind of what you were thinking a little bit, Jeff, but that's definitely where my brain is, is going in terms of like where we may need a separate set of criteria or where if an entity doesn't meet the criteria and puts in an application or feels like they don't meet the criteria and doesn't want to put in an application, they have a potential path that can help them kind of reach that readiness space to, to begin the work. Dan, can you speak to, again, does this tie to some of your thinking around the tiered approach um, sure. that's different levels of readiness that might be we have actually a grant for folks who need to do need technical assistance to get just get things going as opposed to we're ready to do full-on play space i'm just wondering if this is tied to to oriana's good point it sounds like it's all it's all tied tied to that. And, and I think, as you said, the wording wasn't very, I mean, you know, that wasn't just an add on on the tiered part. And, you know, the language might sound a little prescriptive at the beginning, and then it becomes less prescriptive as you go down. And that can be fixed. I mean, I, I think the point is, and if people say, you know, we're not going to be designing the fine elements of this, but I think we send the message, the bigger framework message that there should be as part of our recommendation, there should be funding that not only funds the planning, but also allows people to get ready for planning. You know, just make sure the message is 
that we we see the need for something that's broad and has the flexibility. And for that matter, I mean, leading ultimately to implementation, as some people have said. I mean, you know, you need to look at the whole the whole package going forward. So I think everybody's been talking the same thing. I think it's just how we how we state that in the recommendation ultimately. I think it'd be pretty broad, actually, so long as it includes those those key elements. And then it's going to have to get worked out on the ground anyway, if anything happens with it. So, so I guess I agree with everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, so we can, I can throw out another potential proposal. I feel like there's two things at play here that I don't see people disagreeing with. <laughs> One is, thank you, Daniel, for being with us today. Sorry, we have to see you go. Um, that there should be established criteria for prioritizing selection of places for place-based planning. I don't hear disagreement with that. If you have strong concerns about that, you should raise the flag now. The other one is, should this, this thing be tiered, should be structured in a tiered way? So there's different entry points for groups to access the funding based on their need, their readiness, the kind of particulars of that, of that area. So those are the two things I feel like are in play rather than us getting into the specifics of the criteria, just that they should be established, the state should establish those, and that there should be tiered ways to access the funding based on, to, to create some flexibility within that to allow groups, at, to meet groups where they're at in accessing the funding. I'm fine with that. Do folks have any concerns with those two things? And we can ask the department to try to craft an actual recommendation around this rather than take time in the meeting to do it. Any major flags with those two pieces? Okay, let's move on. And please, if you do, please raise them so that we're, we're all aware of no surprises for the next conversation on this. Um, all right, so let's move on to some of the, the questions around recognizing a plan. Um, here are the discussion points. Um, again, these are all tied to several of the recommendations that you find in the pathways and process. And because we haven't really gone through all of these, we may as well just start with a broader question around What's the potential structured role for the state to assist planning groups after a plan is recognized? So what does it mean to get a plan recognized? What does it get you um, to put it in kind of simple terms? There are options and they show up in these different recommendations in the pathways and process. There's an option around ongoing coordination and technical assistance support for groups. So once you've finished your plan, you've got it recognized, you also continue to get state staffing, technical assistance report to help you coordinate and keep the group refining and assessing feasibility of its activities that are been identified. Another version, potentially add-on or different, is working to address any policy needs that were identified in the plan. So that might be a, an, a support that is guaranteed if there are any policy needs identified in the plan, the state's there to assist. There's assistance in helping planning groups identify opportunities for funding. So this is not dissimilar, I think, to what Oriana and others were saying is, can you create some technical assistance to groups going through application processes, for example, or identifying opportunities where they might wanna go apply for funding um, of existing uh, implementation funding programs? Then there's the potential of actually providing funding directly to support implementation activities via a place-based plan program grant. So that might be another version is that you actually have funding available to provide to these groups doing implementation. Um, and then another would be that you, um, this may not be too dissimilar to the top one, which is commit to, to plan review and updates of the plans every five to 10 years. And there are varying responses to that one. So I want to I want to caveat that there's none of these are yeses or no's. They're just 
discussion points. So let's open the floor to work group members to talk about, you know, what strikes you as some important um, supports that should be structured into this that help a group know, know what it will get when it, a plan is recognized. Kimberly. Before opining on those individual bullet points, I do want to bring us bring us back, but also raise a question. Bring us back to you know the the place based planning structure was originally designed um, as a three step process where you have the place based plans you know where where you develop these plans based on place, and then that um, was supposed to give basins, extra points going into the funding pots that exist. And so that's the 1069 feasibility studies and then 839 uh, project money. So I guess that's the backdrop and I'm not really clear as to why that pathway is not working. Um, and I appreciate there's probably, you know, some can, you know, need to keep the groups together to some degree, but I feel like some of the things on this list um, go beyond that. So I guess, I don't know, I, if anyone has any clarification that would be helpful before. I'm going to actually ask the department to say a few words because you identified this as a, and the independent uh, evaluation identified this as a particular piece that hasn't been structured. So Lily and Raquel, do you want to, do you want to speak to this a little bit before we get the conversation going? Um, Robin, are you asking about the specific recommendation? Are you asking about um, Kimberly's question? Kimberly's question. You know, I think my perception of at least the place-based planning program and how it evolved over time is yes, when we um, introduced the program, we had noted that um, while we had the feasibility study grants program and we have the water project grants and loans program, um, so feasibility study grants being able to evaluate a project. I'll note that we have uh, noted that that program um, is still very limited in scope. So at some point in the future, there is a need to revisit that program because it can only fund water evaluations of water conservation, reuse, or storage projects. So it's not the whole suite of potential projects or recommendations that that program can fund. Um, and water project grants and loan was connected in part because that's the program that the agency has, which is Kimberly noted does have preference points for projects that are developed as part of a, a collaborative approach. So I, I do want to be clear that from the department's perspective, it was never intended that projects that are in a place based plan could only be funded from those funding opportunities. So, for example, it may be that um, Business Oregon or DEQ has a funding program that is more appropriate, and um, we do think that that is still an appropriate funding mechanism for um, projects that are recommended as part of a place-based plan. Um, so, I'll, I guess the only other thing I would note is that there are some recommendations that are in place-based plans that um, are maybe less project-like in terms of infrastructure. Um, and these programs are probably not as well suited to that. So 839, if I recall correctly, um, and I need to go refresh my memory, I think it is focused on um, water supply, new water supply, um, but I need to verify that, but that's my recollection. Yes. So, yes. Okay, thank you. I'm hearing the, the affirmation there. So, um, with that in mind, I think this question around um, the continuation of, of funding, what happens after a plan 
um, is adopted is we have recognized that as groups are going out and trying to apply for funding, they still need to get together to be able to coordinate on, you know, what are we going to seek funding for first? Who's going to provide cost match? How are we going to apply it? How are we going to work with consultants? So there's all these coordination aspects that still need to happen um, even after a plan is adopted. I'll note that I think where some of the uh, questions maybe have arisen in, in is that um, I think there's a desire from some of the planning groups, and I don't want to speak on behalf of them. So this is my perception as someone that has not been in the day-to-day -day of the program, but my perception is that from the planning assessment, that there is an acknowledgement of um, this question of what is the value of doing a place-based plan. And part of that, I think, question was, um, is there funding available to then implement the plan? So maybe that's probably the better way without trying to characterize how the planning groups, their positions on it, um, but rather to just acknowledge that that question arose is what is the value of undertaking um, this process and what do we get at the end for doing it? Um, and so some, I think there's uh, maybe a couple camps on this. The ones that come to my mind are, well, the, the, what you get at the end is that you're more competitive for funding because if you have the statewide interests that have been involved in development of your plan and sign off on the projects in that plan and the local interests have also done the same, well, there's um, likely broad support for that work and that um, makes it a pretty competitive project um, because it's you know, kind of worked through all those uh, differences in terms of interest and how to get to a solution that folks can support. So I think there's that kind of approach, which is certainly how the program um, it was initially designed because we weren't really looking at developing any, we just got Senate Bill 839 passed in 2013 and then turned our attention to developing this program. So we had not contemplated at that point in time, the development of another fund. Um, based on the assessment, I think there's that question has been, you know, posed in terms of what's the incentive to do this plan. And so it could be being more competitive for our existing programs, and that is something the department has emphasized. And I'd say existing state programs. Um, and then I think there's this other question that, that was posed as part of the planning assessment, if I'm remembering it correctly. Lily, um, you probably reviewed it more recently than me, so please chime in if I'm mischaracterizing anything. And that is where this question then came up is to um, should there be a dedicated funding source? Should there, what are the incentives for really undertaking this very comprehensive work? So I'll leave it there. I don't know if I answered all the questions, but um, that is at least my perception um, as someone that has been a little bit farther um, away from this is in terms of what I've retained. <laughs> Well, let's, let's let the group kind of weigh in now, because I think what you've teed up is that now it's, now it's putting before this work group some, some different options. And Kimberly's question is, why not just continue on with the existing um, incentive, um, which is one of those listed in the bullets. Um, so let's open up the floor to others who want to talk about this. I know you want to talk about this. <laughs> I, no, I was just thinking, oh, Kimberly's got her hand up. Go ahead, Kelly, and then Kimberly. Yeah, I was just, I was thinking, um, I am unmuted, yes. You know, this is like the last time that we met in person and Ben, I feel like I walked away talking about this with a couple people that were like, what's wrong with the other one? Like, why would you scratch it? You know, like, let's let's see just how to improve, improve the parts that need to be improved. So, um, I really appreciate uh, Raquel's explanation of um, of those items. And I do, yeah, I, I guess in some ways, I, I think that the only, the way to improve upon this current um, way that it's going is that I do think there should be a clear path. I mean, not everybody's going to take the straightest path forward, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at, too. I mean, some people... To me, this is why we're now applying for coho salmon plans and those kind of things, because they do come with money. It's like we're doing a plan for a reason yeah. because it's going to be implemented. And that's motivation. Okay. No, uh, let me turn. Oh, somebody's on. 
That's okay. Oh, he's suddenly turning off. Um, so in some senses, you know, we we do go for those carrots. Um, other ones, you know, we're we're going for um, as she mentioned because we know we can tap into other state funding. But I'll I'll tell you as a grant writer and somebody who's building capacity in their own organization, it's definitely um, having the implementation money or technical assistance money attached in those tiered approaches is really important, I think. I, ju I just wanted to clarify on uh, Senate Bill 839, that's a really broad, I, I think I think it was stated that it was limited to water supply, but it's not, you can- No, not, not, not limited. Oh, okay, great. I thought I heard limited. <laughs> Dan? Oh, you're not on mute, so I thought just, maybe- I had to, I just switched devices. I just, and one died and I brought up another one. <laughs> I thought, go ahead, Peggy. <laughs> Sorry. So um, certainly I agree with, the Kimberly's original view as far as the three steps were concerned. But we now know that there are many different things. And Kelly just shared some of the different kinds of ways, different kinds of projects or funding or programs that might come out of a place-based planning group. So I wanna make sure that we aren't limiting ourselves with whatever we say in this document to simply things that happen at WRD. Kaylin? Thanks, and I apologize. I'm gonna have to stay off camera. I'm in transit now. Um, I guess I'll go back to my earlier comment, um, which recognized that we have not yet, because we have just gotten uh, some of the place-based planning pilots across the line in achieving recognition. We don't yet have um, any data in terms of like, how does that intended progression go of um, place-based planning to 1069 feasibility study to 839 uh, project funding. Um, but my sense is that the way that the statute is currently written, it enables groups that are doing place-based planning to continue receiving um, funding to allow them to you know continue to coordinate around implementation even if um, they're not the, the funding isn't there to do the implementation itself per se we do have um, they do get extra points you know if you can say this project that i'm seeking funding for for feasibility studies or for project funding was the result of a collaborative consensus-based um, community um, planning project, like you process, I mean, you, you do get uh, a big old leg up. Um, and I think, you know, our Wild Salmon Center's work with the strategic action planning for coastal coho recovery shows like that, the proof is in the pudding there. Like if you can, if you can show that you've got your prioritized plan of how you're gonna fix a problem, um, it can bring a lot of funding to the table. So um, I guess I'll kind of echo Kelly, um, uh, and I don't want to put any words in her mouth, but, you know, like, let's look at what's not working with the, the current process. And I don't even know if we have enough data yet to say what isn't working because we haven't made it all the way through. Um, but that's, that's all I got. Thank you. Kate and Adam. Yeah, I would just make a plug for, I, I think the 839 program is pretty good. I think it would be good in light of Raquel's comments to go back and make sure it's spacious enough to include things beyond just infrastructure. You know, for example, we're working on water banking tools in the disputes that aren't hard infrastructure, but create water supply. Um, and I can't remember how well that fits. So there might be a, a bundle of things that could be expanded. Um, but that pot is going to need a lot more money. I think, you know, to the point of testing out these tools, we submitted a proposal last year that was, I think, would have taken up the entire 
pot that was available. And luckily some lottery funds came in after that, but particularly as more of these plans get done, um, we're gonna need statewide seriously, a serious increase in implementation funding. Um, I, and I think the current pathway is probably just fine, um, but it will need to grow and it will need to increase if we're serious about that. The other point would be just that I do think someone mentioned uh, the value in a group staying together. Again, like I kind of feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but in the Deschutes, like we've never had a finalized plan yet, but we've been implementing the whole time. And I don't see it as a sequential thing that, that ends with a plan. And then all of a sudden it gets magically implemented. I think there's a culture of a, of a base in um, planning and implementing and planning and implementing. And there's a lot of value in continuing to support that work. So there is some, I, I see some value in place-based planning type groups continuing to secure some state support for capacity to continue the work they're doing, hopefully expanding on that with, with other, all sorts of funds as well. Um, so those would be my two comments. Adam? Yeah, thank you. I, and I, I, I wanna echo what's, what's being said here in that I don't, um, and I, I think we're, we all agree that you know, with these plans, if these plans are developed as they're prioritized, as they're implemented, these uh, planning groups are going to be seeking funding. I, I think that's, that's going to be a huge burden on the state to uh, provide mechanisms to fund, not just planning, but implementation at the same time. But it's not overselling it to say that there are other funding opportunities out there to include federal funding uh, for groups uh, that qualify for federal funding, especially with respect to infrastructure and, and infrastructure that not only addresses uh, in-stream but out-of-stream uh, needs as well. There's, there's, there's lots of funding out there. Uh, the important thing is uh, having your project prioritized and identified in uh, a community planning process. Okay. Um, what about people from the group we have not heard from yet? So we've got a couple of our tribal participants. We have a couple of place-based planning folks who haven't weighed in. Um, we have a number of folks who have not really weighed in today. So I wanna just make sure we're not missing you um, unintentionally. And we wanna hear you. April. See if I can manage to doubly unmute myself. Yay, I've done that. Um, maybe I can get my camera up here. Maybe not. Okay, so um, I have been listening and engaging, participating in, in the poll. Um, I will admit I am feeling the pressure of many other work commitments that are converging all around the same time, which I think others are, are also suffering from that. Um, I would suggest that as we move forward, perhaps we can take some of the ideas that we've talked about today that that seems like they need further discussion and additional finessing and um, whether we call it a, a parking lot or however we want to frame it but capture those ideas as being ideas that did not have that needed more work or did not have the full support of the group and and have those things as be things that we could have the state work to incorporate in future efforts as we hopefully look to expand what the state currently has when it comes to assistance to help communities plan. And by that, I mean, we currently don't even have a planning program, period. It's a pilot. There's no more additional opportunities for communities to get financial or technical assistance through that. My hope would be either through this effort or through the department's legislative concept or through another vehicle that the legislature takes action next session to at least extend the existing opportunities, if not build upon that. And so I mentioned that because while there's lots of things that we might want to do 
or could do. Um, the state has very limited resources and a very limited appetite, it would appear, based on my history in working with the legislature. What they do around water is pretty limited, and so we've got to take our opportunities um, carefully and use them strategically. So that's my way of saying that I think we should work on what we can agree on and narrow that and then have a list of things that would be potentially something the department could report back on to future legislators about how things are going, what sort of feedback are they getting from the communities that are, or places or how we're gonna frame it that are participating in these endeavors and, and try and take steps towards having a more robust program that also better ties with other existing programs, which are not only the WRD's existing grant and loan programs, but OWEB programs and other programs that, that have been mentioned. So uh, apologies for being silent. I was uh, traveling earlier, but do appreciate the, the work that everybody has put towards this effort. Thank you. Thanks, April. We still have some more meetings ahead of us, so I'm not gonna give up on y'all just yet trying to, to work on some agreements here. But I think to your point and others, you know, we, we may not get this fully resolved. I think it was really important, uh, particularly to some of the members of the process leadership to wanna hear this conversation, hear from you. And we do have an opportunity for them to say a few closing remarks before we say goodbye. Um, but before we do that, I just want to, in our last 10 minutes, um, I want to just tee up and flag um, what's coming next. Um, so I'm going to share my screen one more time and just make a note that um, <clears throat> we started this conversation. I actually think I heard a number of items that might just be kind of ways that we can finesse this and have uh, uh, another offering forward to the group um, at your next meeting. I don't think we're quite done with this conversation, so I'll just say that we will carry this forward to the next meeting, October 20th. Um, we didn't get into the discussion around checks and balances around supporting place-based planning in general and implementation activities. These were things that came through the worksheet responses that were really tied to conditions for any type of state support. Uh, it says here implementation activities, but really it's state support for place-based planning. Um, and so there's a number of items that we will we will go over at the, the um, October 20th meeting. The other deliberative topics that we have queued up for your next call is um, some potential for doing an introduction or framing these recommendations for the final report. And I wanna show you what this draft final report outline might look like. This is bringing us back to the first conversation you had today about the value proposition, the contextualizing place-based planning as a tool and really trying to kind of lead into these recommendations with an accurate convey from this group about what you see about place-based planning. Um, and then, uh, any of the remaining process and pathways deliver topics, I just said what those will be. And then we haven't gotten into this uh, final section on sustaining effective planning. There's some uh, potential proposals and conversation there. That'll be our primary uh, deliberative topics for next time. We know that there are still some loose ends we need to button up around community engagement. We know there's still a couple loose ends we need to button up around data, although that one was pretty well, um, you reached uh, some pretty strong agreements around that that we will bring back. So um, I'm now going to show you something else real quickly. Um, this is just a, a quick preview of what your final report might look like. People have been asking questions about that and um, I wanna just, show this. Um, this is not something we're going to discuss today, but uh, we need to migrate the straw proposal over to the group's report. So the straw proposal is the deliberative stuff that the department has been putting forward for you to kind of finesse and provide responses to, but we need to actually migrate it over. I think this is not dissimilar to what, you know, April's queuing up for us down, down the line, which is we need to kind of get to where do, where do the group align and where did they find that they had conversation but didn't quite resolve the issues. So this is all tied to the next generation of place-based planning and what your recommendations are. There's a background section that includes just 
the initiating legislation, the assessment findings from Oregon consensus, uh, the formation of the work group, leadership intent expressed at the outset and throughout the meetings, uh, and then orientation to this being a collaborative consensus seeking approach forum, who sat on the work group, how many meetings, all that kind of stuff. Then there will be the work group process results. You've got to have some kind of framing here. Um, potentially, we put in what's the purpose of place based planning tool? How should it sit within the broader framework of planning and management in the system? And any terms and definitions that are meant to clarify the intent of the following recommendations related to evolving place based planning. Um, these are not assumed to be recommendations. This is just an articulation of what your work is. The recommendations then would come from those pieces that we migrate over from the straw proposal. We'll continue to show the consensus, the range of agreement on these recommendations. And what I heard earlier today is important is to really show the specific ties to the pilot evaluation. What did this group, this work group address that's tied to the evaluation? Were there recommendations that are not tied to the evaluation that the group is recommending? And then are there any pieces of the evaluation that this group did not address um, that you'd wanna flag? So you'd start with your recommendations related to planning, you know, data technical analysis, community engagement, maybe some of the pieces from the process and pathways. As an example, this is, you know, one that you, you agreed on last time, which is, you know, funding situational assessments for basins. Um, we would show the level of consensus on this. Uh, in its current form, there's a pretty strong consensus on this, although we will come back to it and we'll lay out kind of where the group fell in the range of one to five. So it's really clear what the level of agreement is. We'll have a section on plan implementation, process and pathways, you know, potentially some things to say about recognition of a plan or how to structure funding or other resources supports for activating implementation. If we get there, you know, we're going to keep trying and we'll get there. We'll get as far as we get and we'll articulate that, you know, as fairly as is comes out of this group. Again, there may be something to say from this section as well, which we haven't talked about yet. Then there'll be a section on outstanding issues or questions for future consideration. Any remaining issues related to the recommendations that did not get fully discussed or reach full resolution, but that the group member members feel should be considered in any future decision-making related to state support and regional planning. Uh, sorry, this should say place-based planning now, but it might be related to the overall system as well. Any conclusions? And then the appendices will have include the protocols, all your meeting summaries and background materials, all the organizing documents that department put together, the Oregon consensus assessment, the information resource list that was uh, kept throughout the process, any other materials. And then if there are any kind of minority reports, we're calling them, let's say there's a strong consensus on an item, but there's one entity who does not agree, you'd have an opportunity to write up uh, whatever your kind of concerns are around it. Um, so that's that's sort of where this is all headed. Um, and uh, it's just for us to know that like, we're gonna migrate these over to a report that is your report, the, the report of the work group. Um, and so it's gonna look different than the straw proposal. It's, we're gonna migrate it over to that. Um, so I really hope that that provides a little bit of, of clarity around what the product eventually will look like and how we're gonna use the straw into your, your final report. Uh, we can talk more about this next time. We don't have time today, but I wanted to give you a preview. I'll send it out to you all um, as a follow-up as well so you can see it, but just know it's, it's very drafty draft. It's just an outline, um, but that's how we'll probably organize it. Um, and with that, I want to just invite in members of our process leadership team. Um, the governor's office staff were not able to be here today. They had a conflict that they couldn't avoid, um, but we do have at least two of the legislators who sat on the process leadership team. And we also have the Water Resources Commission Chair, Meg Reeves. So I invite you in to say a few words. Thanks, Robin, and thanks for uh... Thanks for working through this for a couple more hours. Uh, been some good conversations. 
uh, community, what does community mean, community involvement, funding. Uh, sometimes I think we get too worried about the detail. Sometimes I think we get too worried about what the word means. Yes, I know words have meaning and are important to all of us, but this is gonna be done in partnership with the state, in partnership with the commission, whether communities even get to go forward, if their plan is adopted and what that means. So I think everybody in the group understands it needs to be a balance of interest of people that want to do water planning in that area, working with that community, in stream and out of stream. That's something I think we all can agree on. So once again, I really appreciate what you're doing. Uh, hopefully we can get the outline more populated so there's less room for uh, Representative Helm and I to mess it up. So that would be my goal. You guys keep going. Uh, it's uh, yeah, been interesting, but some tough conversations today. So Meg or Representative Helm? I'll just, I, I haven't been with you as long as Mark has today. What I did hear sounded pretty productive. Uh, and again, thank you for persevering uh, again and, and taking a look at how place-based plan can be improved. Uh, it looks like you're trying to figure out now um, what are the incentives for uh, basins and communities within basins to to do the work. And I think that's really important. And I will appreciate your creative thinking on that. Mark and I were talking with others last night about this very issue. You know, how do you how do you get a community engaged here? And, and then once they are, how do you help them pay for the for the planning and thinking and the doing? So well, uh, great stuff today from what I heard. And um, I'll hand it over to Meg. Thank you. Um, so I don't know all of you. I'm Meg Reeves. I'm the chair of the Oregon Water Resources Commission. And are, can you hear me okay? My headphones have gone kerplooey. Okay. Um, I have not been at your meetings, but I've been following your work. And I just want to express my gratitude again for this work that you're doing. Um, you're handling, grappling with some really challenging issues. And I'm very grateful for that. Um, I do, I, I, I would like to emphasize a couple of items that you've been struggling with today that um, I'm hoping you'll be able to reach more clarity on going forward because I think these are, from my perspective, I think from the commission's perspective, important um, gaps in our current system. Um, and one of the Early, early on in your conversation, there was a, a discussion that related to appropriate role and place for place-based planning within the context of the broader water planning and management system. And I think you kind of um, moved over that during this meeting, but it, it, you know, from my perspective, it really needs, I'm hoping you'll be able to bring some clarity to it, to that general issue, integrating the two is really important. And then the other thing is the significance of rec recognition. Um, this to me is a crucial uh, gap that needs to be addressed. <clears throat> and um, uh, I'm hoping you'll be able to bring some clarity on this too. You had a conversation about um, the water development or the feasibility uh, grant program and the water development loan program. and um, grant and loan program. I think it would be worth a little getting a little bit more background info to the group before the next meeting because I'm not sure there is the alignment between place-based planning and those two programs that the state might want in order to um, <clears throat> be able to use that program to fund what comes out of a place-based plan. So it's worth looking at. And um, so, so anyway, that's my two cents <laughs> about areas that um, from what I've seen in my work on the commission, we could really use some more uh, clarity. So thank you all. Thank you. I don't think Representative Reardon is on the call with us today, um, but appreciate you listening in and um, offering the, the questions and uh, encouragement to the group to keep going um, with the
that, I think we will we'll wrap for today. We do have, we had nobody sign up for public comment. Thanks for asking, Peggy. We've been, we've been tracking and no one has signed up. Um, we will meet again over Zoom on October 20th. Expect it to be a full day again. Um, we are aiming to meet in person on November 1st in Salem. So we are targeting that. Um, we know that this is still, we're still in a hybrid life. So I, we recognize that. We've also heard really strong encouragement and hope from a number, a number of members of the work group to try to meet in person. So we're just gonna go for it and hope that people can make it. Um, it was one of the dates that worked for most and Salem seemed to be the most uh, willingness of folks to kind of meet in a central location and we can get free event space. <laughs> Um, and also just, it's just a, I think it's a place that people can get to relatively easily. Um, just remember we have full, you know, we can fully support each of you attending travel meals, you know, everything can be covered. So if that's the issue, please don't let that be the barrier for you. We know that it's more time. We know that we're asking a lot of you. We know we're asking a lot of time of people. And we know that many of us are not conditioned right now. We've been deconditioned to kind of take account of the extra travel time that it does take to get to and from these, these sessions rather than plopping down um, with your business on top outfit um, to do Zoom calls. But the value of connecting in person uh, cannot be overstated. Um, and I think that a lot of folks in this group are feeling that and feeling the momentum and wanting to keep going. So uh, I'm just going to convey that to all of you on their behalf and, and hope that we can try to make something happen. Um, I appreciate the difficult but very productive and constructive conversation that happened today. And I just hope we do more of the same in October, uh, keep going in October. So the 20th will be our next, November 1st will be the one after that. And we'll follow up in short order with um, all the things. We'll be sending out uh, WRD's uh, you know, meticulous tracking of comments. We'll send a summary of notes. We'll send a, we'll get a version three at some point out to you, but really let's just focus on the deliberative topics that are still on the table for you to discuss. And then we'll figure out how we put them into the report. Um, and words do matter. So I, I appreciate that as well. Um, how you're conveying this, it really matters. What you actually produce and can put your stamp on, it really matters. And we're gonna be um, tending to that um, with you. So um, we're here to support you in all of those things. Um, so thank you so much for your time today, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in a few weeks.